me if I can switch to the. So the big thing with the board members, um, we're trying to use the little owl that's up here. It has a pretty sensitive microphone. Um, it also has a camera that will focus in on who is speaking um, automatically if it works the way that it's supposed to. So the big thing is, um, you know, you can log in um, through the Google Meet, but make sure that your microphone is off because it'll pick up this. It'll use this as a microphone. So let me see if I can get this okay. joined here. Could we make sure that Megan gets a packet of materials for oh, sure. um, introduction? You know, um, Megan is sitting at that table back over there. Get a he brought the packets. I didn't no, no, I got those, but I just mean all the policy government's introduction yeah. sorts of things. Um, um, there's stuff. the book. Do we have it here? Yeah. Okay. It's in the bag. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, can I get you to write down this? I can't get in again. Of course. Of course. Oh, sorry about that. I have the. I actually had a password and address. Yeah, well, I don't think that that's a problem. I can't. That's a plug in at work, you know? Yeah. Oh, thank you for doing that. Oh, of course. Did I actually get you delayed? Thank you. Do you have paper agenda? I mean, I have all the documents. I know. There are papers. Thank you. 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 You're welcome. Yeah, just these packets. Uh, yeah, I, there's another piece I'm gonna pass around when we get to it um, when the time comes. I can't see my head straight today. It's too focusing on too many things in electronics. All right, I wanna make sure. cleaned and sprayed and wiped down. Uh, Elijah Hawks. Elijah's just logged in. Okay. Uh, um, we also have uh, a presentation by Emily Farian about um, her equity group proposal. And we are also going to talk about our strategic goals, our 2020 um, three year plan. We will sort of start to flesh out and decide how we're going to go about uh, deciding exactly how, what, what our goal posts are and what our measurable. Um, activities will be. So I need a meeting evaluator, please. Would one of you be willing to do that? Sure. Thank you. All right. Um, so first thing we have is, is our senior profile. So Elijah, are you ready to um, start us off? I just turned on it. They should be able to. Uh, Eliza, can you actually hear us? Yeah, he's saying yeah. He 
He's probably trying to get his presentation set up. So Elijah, you ready to present? Yeah, I'm ready to present however you'd like me to do that, Lane. I can, I can try to share my screen if that's the best way to, to do the presentation. Yeah, I think that's, that's good because that way everybody who's attending will be able to see it. Okay, great. And Katie and Lisa are there in the media center with you, right? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so let's go to my screen share option. We got it. Okay, so you can see my first slide here. So this is our senior profile with some reflections on the achievements of the Randolph Union class of 2020. How's the audio and visual lanes? Everything working fine? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll take the lead on presenting, um, and Lisa and Katie are here who, who can add in at the end if, uh, if I left something out. And um, if there's a question and answer session afterwards, then any one of the three of us may be best positioned to respond to your questions. We'll take a look at the senior class, the makeup of the senior class. We'll also take a look at some of the offerings at Randolph Union that that, uh, that we offer our seniors and also um, what draws some students from, from choice towns to come to Randolph Union for their senior year. We'll look at the stats related to early college and RTCC enrollment, senior project, some nationally normed assessments, the advanced placement exams, SAT and ACT, world language and industry recognized credentials or IRCs, which are both um, indicators of college readiness and career readiness that we are, are, are looking at. And then we'll take a look at some of the college and career plans for the class of 2020. And, um, and then we'll take a look at some of the things we're doing at Randolph Union to improve our, our academic outcomes with, with our students, um, both efforts that began last year and which continue this year. Our senior class last year was 66 students. About 36% of them were eligible for free and reduced meals. About 21% were special education students. And 14% of those 66 students came from choice towns or, or towns where students used vouchers to come to Randolph Union. So that's towns other than Randolph, Brookfield, and, and Braintree. The four-year graduation rate for last year's group it's still not official yet because the Agency of Education doesn't confirm those four-year rates until later in the, in the fall of this year, but it's anticipated to be around 89 or 90 percent, and that'll probably be a little bit above the state average, um, which has been typical for us the past couple of years, and, uh, but we'll be able to confirm that later in the fall when the agency makes it, a, makes it official. One of the things that, uh, that helps keep Randolph Union students at, at our school um, and also draws students from choice towns to us are the, the number of, of, and the number and quality of offerings that we have both in the curricular and extracurricular realm, which are pretty extraordinary for a school of our size compared to other schools of our size in, in the region. We have AP classes in, in biology, calculus, if enrollment is very low, we sometimes offer those courses through BTVL. We also offer English language and composition, English literature and composition, US history, world history, and French and Spanish are both offered at Randolph Union through level four or five, and our world travel programs extend across the world. So any student that was with us for the past several years may very well have had opportunities to travel to Japan, Germany, well, there's a typo, Central America and, uh, and Canada as part of the French program. 
Our fine arts program includes visual art, music, and theater, and our athletics also include an array of offerings atypical for a school of our size um, from, uh, from sports that are standard offerings like soccer to ones that are harder to, to find sometimes like varsity girls, volleyball or gymnastics, bowling, bass fishing. We've, uh, we've done a good job at Randolph Union to broaden our offerings to, 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 to meet the needs and interests of a wide array of students. And our drama program, as everyone knows, is, is solid and, uh, and has two to three wonderful annual productions. In terms of early college and RTCC, those are, those are two ways that students can pursue their individual learning pathways by, by leaving our Randolph Union's uh, traditional high school. They can go to the Tech Center, of course. They can also enroll in early college program. Last year, about 50% of our, of our seniors were enrolled at the Tech Center, and that's, that's typical for a, a given year um, historically, about 50% of our juniors, about 50% of our seniors, or somewhere between 40 and 50% uh, transition to full day programs at the Tech Center, which is a testament to the quality of those offerings year after year. One thing that has changed, though, in the past 10 years or so is the, the percentage of Randolph Union students who are special education students attending the Tech Center. Um, some years it's, it has been as high as 40 percent or higher, and in recent years, however, that number has come down to about 22 percent, and that's something that we're proud of, actually, because it means that it's a more representative sample of students who are going to the Tech Center, and it's a testament to the work that they've done to attract a wide variety of of learners to their programs through the variety of their programs, through the quality of their academic supports. Um, so we're, we're, we're glad to see that our special education enrollment at the Tech Center is proportional to special education at Randolph Union overall. Last year was, uh, we had about 13% of students enroll in VAST or other early college opportunities. That's where they, they disenroll more or less from and enroll in college uh, and take freshman year courses. And that 13% was around what it's been for the past three years. It's been more than 10% for the past three years. Um, and next year, however, this year, however is, is a little bit different. Only 5% of the senior class is uh, enrolling in those kinds of options. And, I, and we think that that's because over time, uh, students are becoming a bit more discerning and they're deciding for various reasons based on what they've heard from their peers who've enrolled in early college options or because of the quality of the programming at Randolph Union, like our AP program, for instance, that they decided to stay here at Randolph Union for their, for their senior year. So last year was 13%. This year it's about 5% of our senior class who's taking those off-campus options for their senior year. Speaking of senior year, senior park, of course, is an important aspect of senior year at Randolph Union. Here's a quote from a student's journal. She wrote that writing my paper was, that writing my paper required research learning. This is something I had done a lot of through school, and I was most familiar with this type of learning. Making my quilt was much more hands-on. And of course, one of the reasons why we value senior projects so much at Randolph Union is that it, it blends different modalities of learning. It challenges students in new ways. And it's also a culmination of the kind of um, academic expectations that we've had of them throughout their time with us, which is why the, the, the many pages research paper is something that our graduates also often talk about when they come back on alumni day to talk to underclassmen about the importance of doing a good job on that senior project research paper. Even though we experienced the interruptions in school closures of the, of the COVID era, uh, all of our Randolph Union seniors completed their senior projects, and that was thanks to Lisa and some creative thinking that she did with our panel heads and our panels um, to help make sure that our students still had the ability to share their work and, uh, and, and defend it. And 33% um, of students scored higher than proficient on one or more components of senior project. And I don't know for sure, but I imagine that Serena with that beautiful cake there was probably one of those one of those students who achieved higher 
than proficient on one of our components of senior project. Another reason we value senior project, of course, is that it can, it can contain life lessons that one might not otherwise have encountered in high school. This student wrote in her journal, today was one of the most eye-opening days of my life. I spent over four hours at the local food shelf giving meals to families in need. So yet another testament to why senior project remains an important aspect of what we do at Randolph Union. National achievement measures are also, of course, something that we pay attention to, including the advanced placement court. Um, you may not know if you score a three or higher in an advanced placement course in high school, you can, and many schools, get, get college level credit for that high school level course. This past year, and if there are questions about this, Katie Sutton can help answer them later in the presentation. This past year, 62% of all students, juniors and seniors, scored three or higher, and 67% of seniors scored three, four, or five on, on their exams. The numbers of seniors who took those exams was smaller last year. Only three seniors uh, were enrolled. They took, they took more than one exam each. And we think the numbers of seniors enrolled in those courses is a corresponds to the number of seniors who were pursuing early college options. We think that if, if more students had stayed home, we might have had more seniors in our, in our AP classes. And in fact, that's, that's what we're seeing uh, this current year. On the SAT side of, of things, Randolph Union on average last year scored 511 in English and 482 in math. That meets the college and career readiness benchmark of the college board for English, which is at 480, but not in math. We came in um, below that average, and we also came in uh, really below the SAT average in Vermont overall. We can speculate a bit on, on that. We certainly know that it, the number of students who took the SAT was much lower last year than in, in a normal year, in part due to the COVID interruption. Whereas in most years, we'd see 50, 60, 70% of our students taking the SAT. Last year, only 38% of our senior class took the SAT, in part because there were, there were no spring administrations of it. On the ACT side of things, the ACT is another national exam that is used in college admissions and Last year was the first year that we asked all of our students in the upper grades to take it, including those at RTCC. And if they didn't want to take it, they had to opt out. That's because we want to ensure, and the state of Vermont actually wants us to ensure as one of their accountability measures, that all of our students are taking some of these um, nationally recognized assessments. We don't yet have the average Vermont composite score to compare to, but our school-wide average composite score was 17.8. That's a bit lower than past years, and that may be because we had many more students taking it last year than, than in past years. And by the way, I'm happy to share this. I've already shared this presentation with Lane, and we can share the data that is behind it with Lane so that people want to dig deeper into it um, on the board or, or in the public. We certainly can share all of this with you. Average attainment when in high school is commonly looked at by colleges as an important indicator of college readiness. Many colleges that are competitive look for at least two years of, of world language in high school. Um, at Randolph Union, because we've had a robust program for so many years, 47% of our students last year graduated with at least two years of world language, French or Spanish. That's something that we're that we're proud of, and that we intend to uh, that we intend to continue to ask our students to attain. Industry recognized credentials. That's what we call IRCs over at RTCC. As uh, Jason may have already shared with the board, last year every senior earned at least one IRC the program at the tech center, and those help give them a leg up as they're applying for as they're applying for jobs and entering the workforce or continuing their education in colleges. The picture there is actually a picture that I took on our Spanish language trip to, uh, to Nicaragua um, when, when, when some of our graduating seniors were, were actually on that trip. Speaking of graduates, um, one of our seniors wrote in her graduation remarks, we have fought, we have overcome, and we are ready. We are ready to take on the world after what it has in store for us. So go out there, be amazing, and make us all proud. My friends, it is our time, and our time starts now. 
Again, the senior class of last year is to be commended and admired for their perseverance in the face of all those obstacles that the world threw at them during the COVID interruptions. So what were their plans? Well, 55% of them enrolled in two or four year colleges. The five year Randolph Union average is 58.6%. So um, about three, three to four percent fewer of them in college. And about 3% fewer of them taking a gap year. And we, we define gap year as a, a year away from school with the, with the intention to enroll or begin school after that gap year. So our five-year average is about 12%. Last year, it was only 9%. And so that corresponds with an increased number of students who decided to apprentice to join the workforce, 34% compared to a five-year average of 26 and the military enrollment was was two percent compared to three, and one might speculate that, um, that that more students are entering the workforce um, because of the uncertainties about college in the COVID era, or because of concerns about about debt or economic hardship in their in their homes. Um, but those are the the college and career plans from last year class. For the graduation remark. The class of 2020 has completed our year. We passed in your project, our early college and tech center requirements, and we're ready. And are now here to begin our next steps. We have all crossed the finish line. That's a beautiful picture someone sent us uh, from the community this summer of a full rainbow over Randolph Union. So what are we going to be do what are we doing at Randolph Union to help improve our outcomes um, and help improve uh, our students' skills as they are measured on those national assessments, the SAT, for example? Here are a few things that Randolph Union is doing with, with Lane support, support of the district, the support of the district coaches to help improve uh, our student outcomes, grade seven through twelve. So this is not just focused on senior year, of course, but on more um, systemic and programmatic improvements. Last year was the first year that RU was, was, was truly allocated 50% of the time of the district math and ELA directors and coaches, Catherine and Betty, and we had very full collaborations with them last year, which was, which was terrific. And that, that has helped us improve our instruction in math and ELA, um, grades seven, eight, nine, and, and, and up. Last year was, uh, was the first year we had a director of targeted supports to help support learning plans for general education students. So that's students who are on, edu on learning plans but aren't on individual uh, learning or aren't eligible to educate. Uh, Doreen Borkman is the name of the person in that role last year and she continues with us this year. After it was, was a year when title funds were used to hire a literacy interventionist to work with general education students. Again, students who aren't on IEPs, who don't have a disability, but who are below grade level readers and in need of foundational and, or remedial instruction in grades, starting in grade seven and, and moving right on up. Um, we have students who are joining our school um, below level general education population and we, we know that we need to use title funds and other resources to help support them with uh, foundational instruction. Last year was also a year that saw professional development and curriculum alignment in math with full participation of our math department and some elementary educators as well. The same happened in science, including elementary educators as well as tech center instructors who, who teach in programs where there's uh, science standards embedded. We also have increased STEM offerings last year for applied mathematics and other domains, including robotics and other ways that Auto Innovation Center welcomed classrooms into his space. Last year was also a year we had a full-time licensed social worker hired with local budget, not title funds, which is a testament to the importance of that kind of support for students to provide individual and small group counseling and, and case management. Our, our efforts to improve continue this year. We hired a full-time literacy interventionist, again, to help with students who are below grade level in the general education population as a reader in grades seven, eight, nine, and up. And we have plans to hire a second position and to hire a math interventionist also when title funds are available for that. We continue our collaboration with the math and ELA directors from the district, and we have an updated math and science curriculum sequence. Um, it's quite important that we spent the time and effort to, uh, to get everyone on the same page about our 
about our math instruction. We've had a lot of turnover in math over the past couple of years. And so having an established curriculum um, that's been well vetted is going to serve our students and our teachers well in the coming years and give us a lot of a lot of stability. We have bi-weekly meetings of the OSSD ELA math directors and coaches. As you know, our district does not have a curriculum coordinator, which some districts do have. So in place of that, we have uh, every other week a meeting where Lisa and Katie are heads of the lower and upper grades and an elementary principal meet with our ELA and math directors or coaches and, and focus on curriculum coordination, math and English from grades um, pre-K right on up through grade, uh, through grade 12. An additional collaboration this year with the Stern Center for Literacy Intervention. Um, we have a, a weekly junior and senior academy in place of upper grade advisory. And that developed with, based on feedback from students and family, um, saying that there needs to be more focused guidance um, for juniors and seniors to help them with the demands of those years. So that's in place this year. We're really excited about that. And we also have a new local assessment tool that can assess in, in math and English grades 7 through 12, and it's aligned with SBAC. The tool that's being used at the, at the elementary school, it, it goes up through grades 8 and more also through grades 9, but it doesn't give us the ability to track students through 10, 11th, and 12th grade. So um, with, again, with support and with a lot of uh, volition from our teachers, we've adopted a program called STAR 360, and that's really well known across, uh, across the various counties. Um, in central Vermont as a tool that curriculum coordinators use in other districts as well. So we're excited to be using that this year to chart the readiness. And that brings me to the close of, of my remarks. Um, I can turn it back over to our, our moderator and we're happy to field questions if there's time or follow up in any way that, that may be um, in the interest of the, of the board or the, or the public that's here tonight. Thank you very much, Elijah. So first, are there questions from any board members for Elijah or uh, Lisa or Katie about this uh, senior project uh, profile that was just presented? So just, uh, I've got to unmute. So, yeah, um, Do I have to unmute? Yeah, no, you, you just got to talk loud because okay. this is the... So, so we, we are keeping track of this data and we're figuring out ways to improve that data. What are we, how are you deciding where we want to be? So 70% proficiency, ELA math and science on SBAC and Vermont Science Assessment. That's the, that's the original goal. Um, if it's below 50%, that's a threshold where, you know, they can expect direct intervention from central office. Uh, but 70% is the goal, um, given the resources that we currently have, it should be reasonably achievable. Once we reach that, we have to take a look at how we got there, how difficult it was, if we can do more with what we have, um, or if um, we want to exceed that, are there other resources that will be required to do that? Okay, but he was talking about um, SAT scores, AP classes, which all of that is sort of a broad outline of sort of are we feeling good with how our student body is sort of dividing itself out in terms of you know you have a certain number of kids who are going on to college are they scoring where we want them to score are you looking at do we want to trend that up do you feel okay with where they are uh, what kind of, what are you looking at to sort of set your goals for for all of those benchmarks of what he just went through? Uh, 30 years of experience um, and seeing what we were able to accomplish in the other districts that I've been in plus what should be reasonable like I said given the resources that we're pumping in to make these improvements um, I'd have to kind of go back and review the notes that I pulled together when I was coming up with 70%. But it had to do with the way that the testing is set up, that um, it's, a, it's a normalized test, so it's easy to get a majority of the kids to the 40 to the 50% proficiency range. Um, it gets a little bit more difficult as you go beyond that. 
And again, given the resources that we have and that we're applying to this, uh, that is similar to what I've seen in other schools, we should be able to get the 70% proficiency um, fairly easily. So that's in regard to the SBAC, which yep. is done at the end of ninth grade, mm -hmm. right? But we just heard a presentation about other things that we're tracking do we just track those for the sake of tracking those or are you tracking them to to use it as a way to assess are we providing the education that's going to allow those students to get to the next stage of their life and are we going to use those or is it just information for us to to have it's, uh, it's good information for us to have, but more importantly, it's formative assessment information. If this is the curriculum that I am teaching and these are the standards, these are the benchmarks of learning that I want the students to be able to master by the time they get done their 11th grade course, um, these tools provide feedback to the instructor to see if the students are actually meeting those benchmarks. And if not, they also provide data on what things can be approved to get them there. Um, so it's this feedback loop, right? You're doing your teaching, you're taking a look at some of the data, the data is giving you feedback on the impact that your teaching is having on student learning. And if it's not up to the level that it should be or where you want it to be, it's also giving you some data in terms of um, you know, where you need to focus, where we might need to do some training. Um, it gives us data if we've got multiple teachers teaching the same class where this teacher over here, their kids are doing really great on these three standards. This teacher is struggling a little bit, um, maybe as part of the professional um, learning model as we get those two teachers together to share that information so that they can both be doing well on those standards. So it's, uh, it's keeping our finger on the pulse of, of the learning that's happening in the schools on a, on a regular basis, a daily to weekly basis, um, to inform instruction that's coming from the teachers. So. Is and these guys may have other uses for above the, and beyond my with I'm a little so that's the star are you talking about the star? So there's program? star three sixty, yeah. And then there's also track my progress that's used in the primarily elementary level. Okay. But as we look at the district as a whole, we're sort of following and we just heard sort of here are our end results for our for our high school students, and we had so many percentage do, and I know because we have such a small population, but are we just sort of following that trend, and what are we using this data to, to, tell, to tell us, or, to, or how as board members, if we're looking and saying, okay, are we, are we getting the results that we want and we're going to look at SAT information or do you, I mean, should we be looking at? That's a question for... SAT, um, it's a little bit more useful than it used to be. Um, and so let me step back because you ask a lot of questions all balled into one so it will take me a second to sort the pieces out. Um, First off, if the students are doing well in math, NELA, and science, then we would expect their scores to also go up on ACT and SAT, even though we're not directly teaching for that to happen, right? You give them a good, strong foundation in terms of the knowledge, and you give them some good critical thinking skills so that they can apply that knowledge to novel situations. They're going to do great on the SAT. They're going to do great on the ACT. Um, SAT for a long time, um, until they changed its formats, probably four or five years ago now, um, it was a test of reasoning, it was an IQ test. So technically it didn't matter up until four years ago, um, being an IQ test, how much knowledge you had picked up in school because that's not what it was testing. It was testing your ability to reason. They realized that that wasn't a real good indicator um, of how well that students potentially were going to perform in college once they got there. I mean, it might be a, a symbol that they're capable, but it gave no indication really of whether or not they were really going to succeed once they got there. So they changed their format to match the ACT a bit. The ACT was always a subject test, right? It actually tested students on standards in ELA and math and science. 
Um, and so the ACT was always a more valuable test if you were an administrator or if you were a person in a school district because it gave information on how well the kids learned biology and how well the kids learned algebra one and geometry. It gave information that you could go back to the instructors and say, hey, they're doing really well in these areas based on this testing, but these are areas they're a little bit weak in. Um, so they would give you that kind of feedback to let the instructors know where they needed to focus a little bit more. Um, and maybe find other ways of, of connecting with the kids around that, that knowledge and the standards. SAT is now a kind of more of a subject-based test. It tests in, in content now, ELA, math, and science. Um, so it does have value, but I haven't spent a lot of time looking at it since the change because the ACT was always the better of the two for that anyway. Um, so it's actually good that they've chosen that, that they've got all the students that are, are taking that exam. So I don't know, I, hopefully I hit what you were asking. But the goal is, is if we do a better job of the foundational knowledge, which is the board goal, right, and we make sure that we're hitting some of those higher level skills that are so important in today's society, the critical thinking piece, all the things that STEM is, is supposedly about, the students should be able to apply that um, in such a way that they're going to do fine and do very well on the SAT, the ACT, and the other, other tests. But no, those are not the primary focus. Our focus, as the board has said, is, is strong foundational knowledge. And that was the other reason that that 70% proficiency um, on the SBAC and the Vermont Science Assessment was cho chosen because those are, you know, they do, do go into a little bit of the, the critical thinking aspect, the analysis, the synthesis, um, but they're primarily a knowledge test for the most part. So good questions. So I have a question. Amy, think about stuff that I wasn't ready for until ends in a month or so. So, yeah, go ahead. So, for me, um, you know, thank you for this report. However, um, it does not, for me, paint the picture because there's no data to show is there an improvement from last year, an improvement from the year You'll before. You'll get that from me in the Big Ends report. But they can, I mean, they can go back and they can revise, um, you know, the senior project piece. Um, historically, I don't think they presented that testing data to you before. They have. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we've heard testing data for yes. many years. Yeah. Right. I agree, and that's where I actually reflect back on this meeting last year, and I think that we talked about the same thing, showing that data over time, yeah. because what I'm hearing right now, I can read this report, and it tells me that 61% of our AP students scored a three or higher, but in the documentation we heard from Mr. Hawks, that was six students. So again, 61% sounds amazing. We had six students that took that test. Yep. So, and there's actually no reported number on our math scores. We talk about history and literature. So I, to me, I think that it would be helpful as a board member and as a community member to see the, the data over time, the numbers of students we're talking about, and then it goes, in my opinion, to what Ann is asking, if we're setting a benchmark of 70%, where are we falling on that? So is the money being invested appropriately with the staff we have to actually hit those benchmarks? So or my, is it not? My, my data that you have gotten, not you, just because of the time frame for the last three years, is longitudinal data. Uh, mine, when you get it, of course, we haven't had us back. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what the ENDS um, report will look like this year. Um, and it won't be till November because, again, they didn't run SBAC last year. They didn't run Vermont Science Assessment last year. So what the, the folks are doing um, right up through October is they're using those assessment tools to track my progress in the STAR 360 um, up until October. Um, to try to test the kids to see what they learned over the course of last year, given that we had that three-month bump because of COVID, um, and they're collecting that data for two purposes. One, so I can report out on the ends, but more importantly for them is so they get an idea of what the students' weaknesses were um, through the courses that they took last year because of that COVID break, um, and hopefully they can address that this year before they move too deeply into new, new material, especially for courses that are foundational, you know, like a math course that builds on itself. If they didn't learn, you know, a good chunk of the last three months of the math class, it doesn't make sense to be moving full steam ahead into the new one um, until they've got information on what the students um, were weak on last year because of the COVID um, bump 
and then you know doing that that presentation this year to the students to make sure that they got those standards down pat. But the data that you have gotten from me um, since I've been here and interpreted it in terms of SBAC and SATs, you get a report on all the APs as well. You will see it tracked over over time, over five years, and what the trend lines are. And so that's one of the things that we talk about. We invested an awful lot of um, awful lot of funding for the first couple of years in the elementary level, um, and we left the high school alone because they were working on the standards, the report, standards-based report cards, and the, um, the 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 graduation requirement piece. Um, so you see improvement going on. There's been significant improvement in ELA and math at the elementary level. They still got a ways to go. Um, but I believe, if I remember last year, two of the schools were hitting 70% already. Um, and that was because of the effort that was put in. And you can see that in the trend lines. And so hopefully now that the high school is getting started, um, you know, you're going to see the same kind of bump here. They, go ahead. Can I? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, in response to Ashley's prompt, uh, it's easy, it is very easy for us to create a presentation if we know exactly what you'd like to hear. So if you want to hear stats on AP courses over the last 10 years, we have that. Um, I, I have a spreadsheet right here that has probably 400 cells of data in it, which we distilled down tonight to present the senior profile for the class of 2020, because that's what we were asked to do. And we gave you some comparisons to national and Vermont averages, and we gave you some five-year averages also, so there could be some comparisons to past trends. But if you'd like AP stats for the last 10 years, graduation rates, the last 10 years, SATs, ACTs, senior project, number of um, a, uh, world language courses that are graduated, whatever you'd like, if you ask us for it, we can present it to you. And then there's no guesswork. There's no like, boy, I wonder if they want to know this. We'll know exactly what you want and we'll present it to you. Yep. And like I said at the out, I'm happy to provide you with the spreadsheet so that you can pour over the data yourself. And then we can do a question and answer. Whatever, whatever meets the board's needs, we're happy to provide it with as much transparency as possible. Yeah, and that mimics my question to the board at the last meeting about the ends, is that it seemed like there were things that people wanted, but it wasn't clear. Um, I was just responding to the fact that that data is there. I've given it every year in the in the big, you know, the the, the, the superintendent's report that in the end report. Um, but if there are things that you want to see, that's the other thing that aren't there. Let us know. Um, but this year is going to be like I said, it's a little quirky, um, just because of what happened with COVID last year, and we're still not in a regular year. Um, and so it's kind of depressing as they, the high school pulled together, they did an amazing amount of good work kind of getting their structures set up and getting ready to go after these problems and started going after them. And then COVID blew everything up. And so it was like, you know, we missed the, we didn't get the testing at the end of last year that would show us what the impact was. Um, the hope is, is that track my progress in th STAR 360. Um, and one of the reasons that we chose those is because they can tie directly to SBAC. Um, and so, you know, the scores that come out of there should give us a reasonable impression of what would have happened had the kids taken the SBAC. And that was one of the reasons that, that we chose them is because they track very closely with the scores that would be coming out of the SBAC exams. Are there other questions from board members? I have one question. It, it yeah. has to do with the, the social worker. Um, so how do we measure whether that's an effective intervention? Is there a way that we can do that? Can we see some, some results from you know, hiring that person? I have lots of comments, but I don't know if you guys want to comment before I do. So uh, Elijah, the, the question, or Katie, um, or Lisa, is the, the social worker that came in a year or two ago, you know, if you were measuring results to show that they were effective, you know, what, what is it that you're, you're looking at? Yeah. Um, well, we can present numbers in terms of numbers of students served, um, but it's actually very hard to, to represent data on prevention. It's hard to represent data on suicide prevention because the suicide didn't happen. It's hard to represent data on cutting that didn't happen. Um, so if there are particular measures that the board would like us to, to track vis-a-vis -vis mental health in our student community, we can certainly do that. Um, one set of data that we look at as a school and as a state is the youth risk behavior survey data. So we could spend some time looking at that together and we could invite our mental health 
professionals to come and, and talk with you about it. But um, in my experience, there are some fields in terms of human services where it, it actually can be really hard to find the right data to track success. Um, because success means often that something didn't happen that could otherwise be measured. Um, so if there, are, if there are particular measures that you'd like us to consider, um, I'm, all, I'm all ears. And one of the, one of the easiest things, uh, but it depends on, on the student and the reason that they're being served, um, is if you know the students that are being served is, you know, discipline rates. How often was the student being referred, you know, for the three years leading up to their um, years worth of interactions, uh, you know, with the counselor? Um, and did those go down? Um, you know, that's an yeah. easy one that could be tracked. I've but, often argued that our high graduation rate is a testament to our ability to successfully work with students over many, many years, the whole child, both their academic needs as well as their social emotional needs. And so that may be one thing that the board could consider a testament to the emotional work that's done at the school, which is a graduation rate that's above state averages. Um, but again, I'm, I'm open to suggestion from the social side in the room or whomever about how we can how we can best track that sort of thing. But the Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey is broken down by school or by district, by school within district. So that's something we could look at over time as well. And that's that's every other year. Um, and I think was it last year was the last time. Yeah, yeah, because I saw some data on it from last another, year. Another thing we've been doing is is looking at attendance. And that can be another indicator, again, in concert with a number of these other statistics we're talking about. But in, in my case as well, um, if we think back a year or two, one of the things that we had talked about that was potentially getting in the way of some of the academic improvements and some of the climate pieces um, that, you know, the academic improvement piece that I was concerned about and the, um, the climate piece that the board was concerned about was this was one of those components. It's one of the reasons that we started to bring in the mental health piece. It was about matching the right specialist with the need. And um, there was a big influx, at the, especially at the elementary level, of students that were coming in with some severe trauma-based um, behaviors. And that was not only interfering with their own learning, but it was also interfering with the learning of those around them. Um, and so, you know, this was the this was the, the magic bullet to try to help with that. And I think it has had a, if you talk with folks, I think they will tell you that the behaviors have gone down. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. Like, do we, you know, is there a way for yeah. us to evaluate the impact yeah. that this investment has had? If you, um, if you talk when um, Erica and uh, Pat and David come in and they talk about the RISE program, one of the things that I had asked them to do, and it was one of the things they spent a lot of time on in the first year, was trying to grapple with just that, is you know what data is going to let us know um, if this is effective. And it may actually be reflected in the data that the special education um, department has been collecting. Um, one of the pieces with them was they were they pulled together a rubric um, in their goal, which we'll talk a little bit about later tonight, their goal is either having students move to a, a less restrictive IEP, right? kind of a really highly restrictive IEP where the, the student has to work you know, one on one with a parent just to be able to make it through the day. A less restrictive IEP is they might need, you know, do a 15 minute check in every day to make sure that they you know, have their homework written down. Um, so there's a huge range there. But what we'd like to see is they've got this rubric where they're, they've got data that they're collecting on how restricted the students IEPs are so that they can track it over the course of time longitudinally and hopefully what we're we'll be seeing with the changes that we're making is that in general we're moving from restrictive to less restrictive we're moving from the fives down towards the ones on the river um, is the goal and then the other piece that goes along with that is you know are we um, getting students off of IEPs you know, so those are the two pieces that, that they're looking at that they've been focused on. And again, that's going to be discombobulated too because of COVID. Um, they do have baseline data um, from the first year that will be able to show that it's just baseline data because it's the first year that they'll have it. And then it'll probably be not this year, but the year after that they'll have meaningful data again. So, yep. Lisa or Kitty, do you have something to add? I don't think so. I mean, I think um, if you have, you know, more questions, feel free to ask them. If you would like more information, feel free to ask us to provide it to you. 
Um, there's a lot of this that we could elaborate more on for the purposes of the presentation tonight. We wanted to keep it to the senior profile, but yeah. you know, please continue to ask us questions and ask us to, to come and, and present. And one of the hopes I think of using the STAR 360 program is that we'll be able to track specific cohorts of student, students and their growth over time. So eventually part of a senior profile could be if the board wanted to see it, well, how the students started as seventh graders and then how they grew and progressed before they graduated. And I guess one more thing I'd add is that, you know, to Anne's question at the start is, you know, we, we're, we're trying to look at that end goal of college and career readiness, which is why, you know, we provided what we did for you tonight. You know, if a student is choosing one of those different pathways like RTCC, are they getting that industry recognized credential? Yes. If they are, you know, taking an AP exam, are they scoring a three or higher so that when they move on to college, they can actually get that credit? Um, how many of them are going to vast in early college and on the pathway toward college? Um, and why are they making the decisions they, they are um, in terms of their post-secondary planning? Do we have you know, the structures and systems and supports in place to help them get there? That's why the Junior Senior Academy is so important this year. So you know, those are the, some of the things that we are trying to synthesize too with that end game of college and career readiness. Right, and that's exactly, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for because we're trying to assess how are we doing with our outcomes. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if I don't know sort of where, or, and I would imagine even for yourselves, and maybe it's, I mean, education is so hard. You can't like, well, 80% should be doing this. But if, if we're spending resources from the community and we need to justify that to the community. Oh yeah, we're, we're gonna ask for a little bit more. We're gonna ask, we wanna pay for this specialist to come in. We've gotta be able to say, well, you know, we're aiming for all of the Randolph students who are in the tech center to get, instead of just one IRC, they're gonna come out of there with three. And I don't know, I mean, that's where, I mean, I, I get a little frustrated with well, you as board members come up with it. You all are the educators. You tell us and we can, and give us your rationale for why you're coming up with that reason. Like, we're gonna say three IRC, IRCs because this, this, and that. And we're using IRCs because, yeah, I mean, we've heard why they're important. That, that then we just have to look at it, okay, well, is that a reasonable interpretation of a benchmark? And we can say yes, because it's probably gonna make sense to us. And then we can see, okay, how are we doing? Are most of our students getting three IRCs? Or are most of our students scoring where they need to score, you know, in order to move on to the next stage of their life. Are they successful? If they go up to early college, are they passing the college classes or are they getting sent back to the high school? Uh, how are you measuring those things so that we can say to our community, look, these are all of the things that we offer. We've got kids going very different, various different pathways. We're, we're aiming for this, we're, we're putting our resources in here, and look, this, this past three years, we've seen you know, a growth in the SAT scores or a growth in the number of kids who are successful in early college or who are excelling in early college. I, but it, it, that's part of what I'm looking for so that I can judge as a, as a board member, are we, are we investing those resources or, or not. And then we can go out to the community and say, okay, community, this is, this is how we interpreted being ready for the next stage of your life. Are we on track? Is this sort of, do you agree with us that this is the right pathway that we're going on? And, and we haven't quite gotten to that kind of conversation yet. And well, I'm, I'm going to disagree because I put a 35-page report together my first year here that explained in detail everything. 
I do agree with you that it, it doesn't sound like what is there isn't meeting the desires of the board, which is why I opened up the discussion or tried to get more specific. Um, you know, what is it that you, there's got to be pieces that are missing here that you really want to see that I'm not aware of. Let me know what they are. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go after them. Um, but there was a, there were weeks that were spent on putting together the rationale for why the ends were pulled there. I was pulling from the research that I was doing in my doctoral studies at the time um, as well that went into that, that paper and why those things were chosen and chosen at the levels that they were. Um, so again, that's why I'm saying that that may not be suiting your needs and if it's not, I need to know what it is that you would rather see. Because that too is part of your strategic planning process. If you come back and say, hey, you know, you guys are working on this, but this isn't really where we, as the representatives of the community feel that things should be going, we need to know that. Um, so that, you know, we're refocusing the resources where, where um, folks feel it should be. And I think, to be fair, this time we did ask them to to tell us about the seniors. So we okay. asked for the senior profile, and that's typically, we used to do it like in August, but since the, the numbers don't come back, we've been doing it in September the last few years. Another time of year, we asked for other types of data. So I think, you know, we have to be fair about what we did ask them to prepare. And right, was right. senior well, data. Right, and that's where I'm, a part of me is almost questioning, is this a good use of our time? I think so, I mean, this is our end product, right? Finally, these guys graduate. We have a, a this is a snapshot of like, so There's what? Not. So what if we have nothing to judge it against? How did we do? We know how we did, but we don't know how we did. Was it, were we on track? Did we hit our goals? Were we where we wanted to be? Well, we saw the SAT scores compared with, you know, Vermont's and national, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, and part of my standard presentation to folks is you'll see the, the trends over, um, over at least five years. I mean, I, I believe in three-year trend lines because the data jumps around from, from year to year. You've got to have three years to have an actual trend line that means something. But you'll see all that when, when I do it. And I break it down by school and everything um, when we do that big, big report. But, I, you know, it, I think you're right, Anne. If we want something different, we need to decide what it right. lo and should maybe, look yeah. like. Right. Maybe at our strategic planning session, we can flesh that out a little bit more. But it just seems like, well, I guess we're never going to have goals, I mean, that were benchmarks that we're shooting for, except for your SBAC benchmark of 7%. There, there are, you and have, you, when we talked about this, it was outlined in the last ends is that you have a mission statement, which are your ends. Um, in there, there are six or seven that are foundational knowledge ends. You have an adaptability end. You have a whole number of ends. And the reality is, um, is that not a lot of work was done on a lot of those ends for a long time. Um, people were focused on things and good things for kids, but it wasn't specifically those ends. And so the first year, which is why that first report was so blink and long, was because I was trying to figure out how to do it all um, with some stuff that hadn't been done in quite a, quite a long time. Um, so I've narrowed it down to four things um, that I think are critical. Once those are accomplished well and have hit the benchmark, then I'll move on to the other parts of the ends. They are science, they are math, they are ELA, and they are special education. These three are the most visible to the outside world because our testing data is published. If we do well here, the hope is, is that we're keeping our enrollments up and drawing in more, more people. The ADM um, counts go up and we've got more resources to pump back into the, the, the schools um, to help us out even further with our programming and the other things that we want to accomplish. But until I hit that 70% benchmark in, in these three areas, and until I get my special education um, percentage, right now we're at 22.3% of the students in this district are on IEPs, until that gets down to the national average of 14%, those are big goals and they're more than enough to work on. If you want to try to spread me out over 14 different ends, it, it, none of it's going to get done or done well. So I've chosen those ones specifically because they're high visibility, they are also foundational. If you're doing well in ELA and math, 
that's going to support you in the other work that you're going to going to do here. If we can work with the, the students um, that are on the IEPs and get them independent, um, really kind of restructure the program so that they are getting the skills they need so that they can come off those IEPs and be independent, then we've got something to work with. And then we can go after the whole shebang. So it's not that I'm neglecting the other ends. I made the decision after the first year of trying to do it all and, and being scattered that it's not possible that you know the, the decision was. And you guys can refocus me if you want and say, no, those four aren't the priority. These, these two over here are. But those were the four that were chosen to, to be worked on until we get to those benchmark. And then we, we bring on more um, at that point in time. Because um, it's just, it's, it'd be too much to try to do it all at once. Um, especially, like we said, part of it's been structure building. You know, we didn't even have the structure to do the, the math in the ELA until a year ago um, to get those coaches in. So, well, it's a good discussion, but there's, there's yeah, huge pieces here. So I, I like it. And I, I love the questions, too. So. so are there any other questions from the public who are attending this meeting remotely? Do you have questions for uh, Elijah or Katie or Lisa Floyd? Make sure you turn your uh, your mic uh, on if you're gonna if you got a question. I don't see anybody. If not, um, we will move on. Uh, thank you very much um, for that presentation. We really appreciate your time and the effort it took to, to put put it together. Um, all right, next we have a quarterly facilities monitoring report. Um, so I, I revamped this, so I've given a new copy to folks, which is here. Um, just a, a couple of basic things, unless there's questions that come up. Um, what's in yellow is everything that's been accomplished since last time. Um, it gives you an idea of the work that was done. Um, over the summer, there's been significant improvements to facilities um, kind of across the, the board this summer. So it wasn't just the work on um, making sure that we were prepared for coming back to school in the face of COVID, but it was also making sure that we were keeping up on the important task of maintaining our facilities in the way that they, they should be maintained. Um, in addition to that, if you flip uh, the page over and you look down at the bottom, um, starting off under, uh, actually that's an interesting one as well. We can talk about that too. Um, but the, the, everything below the third one, all those are additional things um, that we are trying to do to improve uh, the HVAC systems across the district. They are not necessary to do. We are in compliance in terms of CDC guidance, but they are things that will enhance um, the effectiveness of our HVAC systems, um, especially in terms of filtration. Um, a lot of it is uh, putting in new exhaust fans, ones that are a little bit more efficient, blow, blow the air a little bit harder, a little bit faster. Um, some of it is sensors. Um, we do have a fairly automated system um, that can keep track of, of what's going on um, in terms of where the air is going, you know, what the quality is. Um, and it comes back to a central readout, but we need the sensors in place to be able to do that. So some of that's for sensors. We do have the nurses' um, offices kind of up and running with fans in the window to get the negative pressure. Um, but we did go out. We're waiting for the, uh, the grant that we applied for, um, for the money to come in. Um, they're actually going to come in and put the nurses' office in their, their um, they have a little area they're supposed to put the students if they think they're infected, a waiting area. Um, and putting those on a completely separate HVAC system than what exists in the, the other schools. Um, that way there's no cost contamination of air. So all those things are, are happening. Um, a lot of it is we're waiting for the grants. Um, you may get a request from me, depending upon how long it takes to get, uh, get the, the grant money, to just pull it out of the facilities fund and just get it done. And we'll get reimbursed what we can from the grants after the fact. Uh, but right now we're waiting here on the grants. So those are the big things in terms of the Oh yeah, the well. So um, we did do, uh, as you remember, we did try to do some work on the well at Brookfield. Um, we realized that there was infiltration uh, of saline uh, solution that was getting in there. It was actually coming from the um, water softener. Um, we did 
some repairs of the wells. We sealed off the sides so the water was only being drawn in from the bottom. And on top of it, we pumped the, the tar out of it to try to drain as much of the saline water out as we could. The salinity is way down um, compared to what it was, but it is still not in the place where it would be comfortable for people to drink. It's safe to drink but it's not going to taste well, um, a lot better than it did. But it will take years of using that aquifer to actually drain out all the, the salinity that is in there. I mean, it'll slowly go down over time, but it'll take years. So right now, we've had them come out, and they've done a little bit of research. Um, if you look at where the field, the brook field is, and you go beyond the trees, there's a nice spot that they should be able to, to drill into a completely different aquifer out there. And so we're in the middle of the process of examining that and putting in a new well. Um, so that may be coming um, relatively soon for a request for facilities funds for that. And you can see what the cost is. You know, it'll probably be in the $130,000 to $150,000 wow. um, range to replace that well. Okay. So other things that are on the horizon. Any other questions about facilities? I just had one question. Um, when do you plan to hear from the HVAC grant? Like, do you know when, the, when you're supposed to hear from it? They are hard to tie down. Um, one of the problems, um, and I wrote about it a little bit in the, uh, the superintendent's report, is about the reimbursement funds, mm -hmm. is they are setting aside money and grants for us to be reimbursed, but it's always, um, they're setting aside about a third of what is actually needed. So, you know, when they came up with that HVAC grant, oh, it was great, but um, the applications and the need was three times what they put, put in for it. So odds are we'll get some, um, but it won't be enough to cover everything. And we've got plenty in the facilities funds to cover this, um, the reserve funds. I'm getting a little bit worried about the reserve funds because we've got a, a good amount in there. Um, there is talk every now and then during legislative session that, hey, you know, this might be a way to fill the gap in the, you know, what can we do about these reserve funds that the schools have? And so I'd rather... You know, the talk at the end of last year because of that was, hey, are there ways that we can start to go after the reserve monies that we had? Still keep a, a fair amount in reserve, um, but also start putting it to the good, good use of improving the schools and the programs for the kids. And so that's kind of what we're doing. That's why you're seeing a lot of this uh, mm -hmm. facilities upgrade work going on. And then the roof um, that was replaced on Randolph Elementary and all the HVAC equipment that was replaced up there this summer, um, that came in a third of what we thought it was going to cost. Um, you know, we thought it was going to be about 1.5 million. The two together came in, you know, in a half million, you know, $700,000 range. So um, we were saving for that for a while. Um, so there's quite a bit of money in the reserve funds. Yeah. So when you say that you would ask us um, for that funding from the reserve, what are you, if you're thinking? Oh, about so October yeah. So you, had, you had, I apologize. You haven't been through the process. So what typically happens is at the end of a budget year end of a school year, there is money that's left over for various reasons. Um, actually, come the next March, that money that is left over, it's called surplus money. That money that is left over, it goes out to vote, and the voters will vote to put it into one of our reserve funds. So that money sits into the reserve fund, um, and those reserve funds have different names on them, like one of them's facilities, one of them's transportation. When the town votes to put it into one of those funds, they know what we're going to use it for. If it's in the facilities funds, we have to use it on facilities. If it's transportation, um, it's used pretty much to replace the buses as, as needed that are up there. Once the town has voted to put it into those reserve funds, um, my responsibility is coming to the board if it's something above and beyond the normal um, budget and saying, hey, um, here are the bids that went out. This is the one that we chose. This is the dollar amount we're looking for to do this work. And if the board approves it, we can then access those funds to do that work. Mm -hmm. So what, I'll, I'll, what you'll be seeing, you'll actually see one of those requests tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but what you'll be seeing is you'll be seeing a, a request probably for some of that HVAC work. Um, and then you'll also eventually see a request um, from the reserve funds for that well work. Okay, thank this you. This sometime. So, yeah, no question. Okay, um, next we have a presentation from Emily and Dana, uh, Emily Barron and Dana Decker about their equity group proposal. Are you women ready to uh, discuss this with us? We actually did put you up front. Hi, everyone. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to begin talking about the raft and then I'm going to hand it over to Emily. It will be um, factual and quick. And, um, and I'll also um, share my screen so you all can um, take a look at the document that we're working from. Thank you. So Emily and I are here to share our progress in forming an equity action committee and equity focused professional development across the district. The following is our rationale based on training that the middle school, high school faculty, faculty did um, last school year with the Equity Literacy Institute through a grant that um, Emily was given. We are continuing the equity support in our building, but would like to see this work expanded to our TCC and the elementary schools. Um, we need to be better at developing and continuing to support our BIPOC students along with our white students across the buildings within the district. Continue dialogue around race, increase capacity to have the necessary um, uncomfortable conversations with our students and with each other is imperative to move forward with this work. We would like to continue the equity education among staff and faculty as a suggested area of focus in order to build a more inclusive school community. We research indicates that equity literacy amongst educators is a significant factor in improving the educational experiences and outcomes of all students, especially students of historically marginal marginalized identities. Our U began to, um, Randolph began to successfully train teacher leaders to facilitate equity conversations in um, what is called the PLCs, the professional learning communities, and it's a model that we would like to continue with this work. The Equity Action Committee will serve as a district level group supporting the implementation implementation of the professional learning community model at, um, throughout the different schools to facilitate PLC discussions at each school. This equity-focused professional development propo proposal supports two of the S OSSD um, core values. Um, and that's what, that was our rationale of um, starting this committee. Does anybody have any questions? before I hand it over to Emily. Any questions from the board? Not so far, I don't think, Dana, thanks. Well, I'm always open for questions. You could email me if you think of something in the future. And I also continue to welcome any board member to come to school one day and um, look at the work that we're doing at the high school and at the middle school level um, through this equity um, and also my racial justice class. You're more than welcome to come and observe anytime you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dana, for that introduction. Um, so I'm just going to touch on um, a little bit of what the structure of the committee would look like and what our next steps are in the process. Um, so we were able to meet with Lane last week um, and touch base on um, what some of those kind of bigger next steps look like. Um, and the, as Dana mentioned, the Equity Action Committee would really serve as a um, a venue for um, teachers at the various schools to come back together and kind of share um, share their progress and shape this equity focused professional development from a central place. So we are um, all kind of working from working from the same who is there in terms of um, what our goals are and how how we want to approach um, this uh, professional development. So the um, committee would really be composed of um, uh, teacher leaders in the various buildings who are interested in engaging this work and want to serve as professional learning community um, leaders or facilitators in their schools um, who would complete um, some additional uh, training in order to be competent in those different areas. Um, the uh, building principals, if possible, would also be members of that committee as folks who um, also shape professional development in their buildings and support teacher education, um, and um, a committee chair who's, who's overseeing it. Um, our uh, next steps in the process after meeting with Lane last week um, is our 
main next step is really to work with building principals to identify um, teacher leaders in their buildings who are interested in this work um, and who have the, the time and the capacity um, to pursue this additional training that would happen um, outside of our regular professional development. So the um, course that we would be asking PLC facilitators to take is through the Equity Literacy Institute, which is the organization that um, Randolph Union worked with uh, to start this work uh, last year. Um, and it's uh, about a one month course um, where it's like a train the trainer model. So um, teacher leaders taking that class would um, gain the different skills necessary to um, facilitate groups of their colleagues who might be at different um, levels of understanding or interest or capacity in terms of their experience um, with equity focused work um, and social justice work in schools. Um, so really trying to meet the varied needs of um, all teachers in all of our buildings. Um, after um, we have worked with building principals to identify those teacher leaders, um, we would get them signed up for that course. Um, if possible, uh, we could begin those um, PLC meetings this year. Um, it depends a bit on the individual schools. Um, process for planning professional development, um, but at the very least, we would like to um, complete the train the trainer work uh, this year and this fall and um, be ready to go with those professional learning communities um, next year, um, if not sooner. In terms of um, financial implications for this project, um, we are still working on getting comparable numbers from outside districts um, as far as stipends for these positions go, um, but looking in district with um, comparable hours um, outside of our regularly contracted hours, um, we estimate that the PLC leader stipends would be $750 per person, and that's with um, approximately three to five hours of work um, per month outside of, again, a regular um, professional development. And that also um, depends on whether those folks are able to start facilitating those groups this year or whether we're just asking them to take the course this year. Um, and in speaking with Lane, um, it seemed appropriate to um, approach building principles about professional development funds to support this work. Um, and so that's really our next step is um, working with those folks to um, figure out what our capacity is for this year um, and what is going to best meet their building needs. And if anyone has uh, questions, Dana and I can uh, do our best to answer them. Well, I was just going to quickly ask whether the building principals had already shown interest in this work being done at their schools and with their teachers. Part of the... Um, we know... Go ahead. Go uh, ahead, Lynn. Okay. Um, part, part, part of the discussion was um, checking in. <coughs> I have allergies, so I apologize. Um, it was checking in with the elementary principals to make sure they had the conversation with the staff um, to get some input from the elementary staff. It sounds like they've had the input already from the high school staff. So, yeah. <clears throat> I'll be back. i got to get a sip of water. I can answer also only. Um, so what we decided to do was Lane was going to check in and tell them that Emily and I were going to um, ask for a meeting with them. And um, and then the next step where I was going to email the principals this week to see um, uh, the interest level of Emily and I showing up to the faculty meeting at the elementary school and then a faculty meeting at RTCC um, to talk about this work also. So we're right in the middle of working with the principals and the faculty at all of the schools. And what would you like from us tonight? Um, so we're happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Um, we were really just hoping to provide an update and give folks an opportunity um, to weigh in if necessary. But um, other than that, we're not looking for anything specific. We're kind of working on those next steps with the principals. Okay. Any other questions from the board? 
Any question from any of the public um, who is listening in to this call? Appreciate the time and effort that you guys have put into to, to making this happen. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for the opportunity to share with you. And as Dana mentioned, um, please let us know if, if any questions do come up um, or if you're interested in learning more about it. We'd be happy to speak with you more. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, so next, oh, we have the board member replacement process. Um, I want to say hello and recognize Megan, who's here. Um, she's the only one who has submitted an application, a resume, and what have you to um, take uh, the place of a Randolph uh, board member who stepped down. Um, so that position would last until February, um, where you have to run again. Um, and I need an update from Lane about exactly where that process is. As I understand it, uh, we're sort of in between a legislative um, decision whether select board needs to approve that. Is that what your understanding is, too? I, I think so. That yeah. was the last time I heard about it. So we may need to wait for uh, for select board approval um, before we can actually um, have you sworn in at the town clerk's office. All right. Um, hopefully, so hopefully next meeting you will be sitting at one of these tables and joining us. All right. Um, next, Lane, the budget parameters. So usually um, <clears throat> this. The time of the year we're getting ready to kick off the official budget season. Um, typically October is the heavy month um, to get started. I'm set up to uh, <clears throat> start with a cabinet next Wednesday. Um, but this time looking back at Brent's old notes in previous years is an opportunity for the board to kind of chime in a little bit about priorities, what its concerns are around budget. And I'm going to help you out a little bit by giving you uh, kind of what the landscape currently looks like right now. And again, that may change quite a bit <clears throat> as things develop in terms of, uh, in terms of COVID. Um, right now, um, the biggest problem is all the unknowns, uh, right? So um, cost of COVID reimbursement, um, it's kind of like the HVAC piece. There were three different funds um, that we could potentially draw from to reimburse us for the additional unanticipated cost this year um, for COVID. Um, one of them was reaching out to FEMA, which we did. Uh, the other was the Coronavirus Relief Fund, um, which we've also put in the application for. And the other is ESSER funds, which are a subcategory of CARES. <clears throat> the problem in each of the cases is that the amounts of those monies that the state has set aside um, is always about a third of what the requests are. Um, right now, for example, the coronavirus relief funds that the state received about a billion dollars for um, across to help the state out in a, in a number of areas, they've dedicated $29 million um, to helping out the schools in terms of reimbursement. There's $71 million in requests of legitimate reimbursements across the state right now. So if you take a look at <clears throat> COVID itself and the fact that there are 55 districts in the state of Vermont and it's cost 71 million between the start of this in March and getting our doors open this year, it's over a million dollars a district um, of unanticipated funds that, that, that people are spending trying to keep things up and running the way that they should. And it does not look like there is money there to reimburse us for all of it. So that's the first unknown. Uh, next unknown, <clears throat> teacher's contract for this year has not been settled at this point in time. Um, and uh, the contract that we are talking about is also going to be a one-year contract because nobody knows what the landscape looks like next year. Um, so the second that we get this um, put to bed, we're going to be right back at the negotiating table trying to figure out um, the contract for the, the following year. <clears throat> The other piece that I want to remind people of um, was the cost of health care for the support staff um, went up dramatically last year. That was the biggest increase to the budget. Um, that was only half of it. Uh, remember that uh, they don't potentially switch onto the upgraded health care plan until January of this year. So what we planned in the budget for this year 
was half of those potential health care costs next year, we would potentially have to add the other half, right, to get them through a full year. Um, <clears throat> so that's 366000 um, just on its own, um, that piece. Hopefully what will happen is January will come, and, um, you know, the people that need the insurance will take it, and not everybody will, and it will be less than we anticipated. Um, but we were pretty sure of our numbers um, based upon the calculations we did and the folks that we checked in and people's family situations and what they were planning to do. Um, so that's a big piece there. <clears throat> in terms of uh, other ideas, the district right now, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, when we get to the special education. You build structures to support what you want to do, and then you go to the, what's called the adherence level, and then you go to the delivery level. We've had the funding because the community and the board has been so great over the last two years to build the structures that we need. So we've got what we need to move forward um, for right now. <clears throat> there are two potential pieces that should be discussed, however, um, especially given COVID. Um, one of them is the fact that uh, we don't have a full-time nurse at the two little elementary schools. Seems like this would be a good time to have that, um, especially given, you know, potentially what uh, the staff in those buildings might face if a student comes in showing symptoms. Um, so I think we do need to talk about the potentiality of, of increasing nursing at the two small elementary schools by about a half a PTE. And then the other outstanding question that is there is <clears throat> when I redistributed the administration at the elementary level, making sure that we had a full-time principal at each of the elementary schools. There was the request um, for additional administration at RES because it's a bigger school. So those are the only kind of two other pieces out there that you know paint you know the picture of the potential budget landscape for the coming years. It's a lot of unknowns right now. Um, we do have most of what we need in terms of structures to get things moving forward on those, those four big areas that I talked about, you know, the math, the LA, the science, and special education um, to be able to get the district moving forward. Um, <clears throat> but just, just too many unknowns. Um, we do have plans in place for uh, a potential shortage um, in budget, um, we saved as much as we possibly could at the end of last year. So there is a significant surplus, um, supposedly, at the end of this year. The goal is, is to take that surplus money um, to have the town vote in a reserve pot of money called operations that we can put it into and use that to cover any shortages that we may have. And then if there is money left over, hopefully apply it to the next year so that we don't have to ask as much from the taxpayers and get them through the next year. Everybody is predicting that the next year um, is going to be the tough year on folks. Um, <clears throat> the year that we're currently in was already planned for. Um, you know, people already knew what the taxes were coming. Um, you know, COVID hit, you know, partial the way through, so it wasn't as painful. Um, but we're potentially looking at a full year under COVID. Um, you know, coming up. So there are plans in place to try to mitigate things, but that's what we're looking at as we go into this budget season. So this is the opportunity for the board to talk about its concerns or its priorities or uh, things that you want us to keep take into account as we're having the discussions at the cabinet level. <clears throat> Any comments right now from board members on budgeting? Well, I'm just curious, are you foreseeing increasing the again intent, or trying to level funds for <clears throat> next year? My intent, if everything works the way I hope, um, is to keep it level, but to actually be able to offset it with some of those surplus funds so that it's actually, at least for a year, it's a decrease. Okay. That's my goal. The other possibility that we have, and this is something that we'll have to discuss as a board, we've got 
across all the reserve funds that we have, there's probably three to four million sitting there. Um, the other possibility that we have, and again, we'll have a better picture when we get to January of, of what things are looking like for next year, is because we've got so much money in those other reserve funds, and since the town has helped us out, maybe what we could do, we build that operation fund, we take some out of those other reserve funds to add to it so that that next year, you know, it's a low, low year for taxes for folks to try to help people out in their time of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are machinations going on um, that, that may help. But the problem with both of those two things um, is going to be communication with the community. They need to know what they're voting on and why. Otherwise, when they see big dollar amounts on those, um, on, on, up for the vote, because they have to vote the amount that goes into those funds, don't want them to think we're asking for more, when really what we're trying to do is, is potentially help them out. So. And, and how much does, I mean, so it's a state education uh, payment, form of payment, so we actually pay to the state and we are reimbursed. We, you know, so we get we get uh, a check from the Ed Fund that's the state, but we also get a check from the town. Right, yeah. I understand that, but I'm just saying that you know it's it's not it's not necessarily a reflection of how much our budget is, um, you know, because we we also you know we get sometimes more from the state than we pay in. Yep. Yeah. yeah, but uh, part of it is that if I know. Say the budget next year is 20 million. If I know I've got a 1.1 in sitting in that reserve fund, then I'm only asking for the 19 point, you know, whatever, or the 18.9, you know. And it will have an impact both on the, the Ed fund, which they'll be happy about. Um, they were pretty upset with me the last two years and being able to get the town to step up to, to what they provided for the district. Uh, but it'll also help out the local. About 33. <clears throat> I think about 33 percent is local. Well, it comes local. Okay. Um, anything else on the budget parameters? Next, we have board governance budget. So you guys um, have typically uh, been budgeting ten thousand dollars for yourselves, and that's for your yearly eight hours of training that you need to do. Um, and for any of the other initiatives that you have, um, typically what you've spent is between four to six thousand. Just so you know. Right. So, so this is your opportunity to change that if you have bigger things that may be on your mind, and you don't have to make the decision tonight. I mean that that's not until January, but just so you're aware of, of where you're at and what you've historically spent. Right. I think the superintendent evaluation money went out of that as well. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Any questions or comments about board governance? Comments? All right. Uh, next is second reading and approval of electronic communication policy. Uh, we received this last month. It may also be in this um, packet. Are there any questions for Lane? This is a mandated policy. Any other questions? Um, do I have a motion to approve the electronics communication policy then, as as written? I make a motion to approve the electronic communication policy as presented. Is there a second? second? Hannah, second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, next, we have an uh, update about union negotiations. So, it actually, they weren't pretty well. Um, so the support staff has been approved. You guys know that you, you, you approved it. The future negotiations went, went pretty well in terms of um, you know contract language um, uh, back and forth and trying to, to trade things of equal value um, that both sides wanted. The main sticking point um, ended up being salary. Um, it's still unresolved at this point in time. We did go through uh, mediation. Um, the next step is fact-finding, um, but there is still negotiations going on a little bit behind the scenes. The mediator every now and then will reach out and say, hey, how about this amount, and 
we'll reach back and say, well, um, I, I connect with the, the group that's on the team and, and uh, is this okay to, to do as an offer? Um, so right now, um, there are two offers that are there I have not heard back. Um, again, if what I'm told is correct, um, the last offer from the, uh, the association was 3.8% for next year for one year. And um, the district offer right now is 2.6%. Um, in terms of, I think one of the reasons that folks may be coming to the table now is they're starting to get comparables. There are other districts that have settled. Um, and the settlement ranges from the other districts right now are between 2.5 and 3.1%. And so usually what a fact finder does is they go out and they take a look at what's happening around. And that's the facts that they use to determine you know, what we should be doing or what, what's reasonable. Um, so we are, we are in that range right now. Um, the association is not. There was one district that settled for just about 3.2%, but the reason that they did that was because they were one of the few districts around the state that actually got a benefit. They actually, their costs went down significantly uh, because of the healthcare um, plan. And so, um, you know, if you take into account uh, the savings that they got from their healthcare plan and what they were exchanging with the, their union on, they are actually a 2.78% increase, so, yep. And after fact-finding, what, what, what happens then? Oh, so I'm going to, I'll be, I'll be in the ballpark, but I may not be 100% oh. accurate. Okay. So if it fails at fact-finding, um, the next step is arbitration. So the arbitrator will take a look at arguments from both sides, will take a look at the fact-finders report and say, this is what you should do. They'll, they'll, they'll run to a finding. Doesn't mean that either side has to agree to it. So at that point, so it is, it's, you know, hopefully it's, something that's agreeable, hopefully we, we get to a, a resolution long before that. At that point in time, um, there are two possibilities. Um, we just, we go without a contract, we keep working at it. Um, we can impose a contract, um, which means that, you know, since we weren't able to reach an agreement, this is what you will do. Um, you know, and for me, if we ever got to that stage, I would say, you know, give them this for a, a salary increase that's in, the, that's in that reasonable range. Um, and then if they're not happy, they can go on strike. And as long as we are not settled, it's on last year's contract, correct? Yeah. But usually what will happen is it's sitting on last year's contract, so the, the, in terms of the, the salary and, and all the other potential changes that we've talked about, but typically what will happen is once we settle, they'll get retroactive for the year on what we settle at. Okay. Right? So if the increase is 3.6%, They'll get that 3.6% on the whole year, not just the part of the year that remains. Okay. Yeah. But just to repeat for my own, you know, yeah. there's still a chance we won't go into. Um, it's that. it's a good sign that the mediator's still working behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's still okay. there's still discussions going on to the mediators. Yeah. Yeah. So after fact finding is done, the report goes to to both parties, mm -hmm. and then they can. They can, agree, agree they can still try to that. try to negotiate around what yeah. the fact finder found out. And typically, um, we've we've had a pretty good relationship in terms of just being open with the community. You know, typically the fact finder's report is published. Everybody knows what it is um, out in the community um, to know what the fact finder is saying. And that way, they can kind of evaluate us too. You know, was the the union uh, being reasonable? Was the board being reasonable? What the offers were? Um, you know, and if they weren't, then maybe they should change their tune a little bit. You know, that's, that's part of it, is getting that political pressure in there as well. But yeah, no, the negotiations would, will continue and then it would go to arbitration. And even that arbitration stuff? Um, you can pull, yeah. And again, this isn't binding. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering back my readings in Vermont from about, about two or three years ago, it's not binding. Um, which means that even if it goes through arbitrations and people still aren't in agreement, then you know, you're looking at potentially imposing a contract or a strike. I think you guys have been to fact finding before, mm -hmm. more, more than once. Yes. Yeah. I don't think that's unusual here. Yeah. Good. Okay, uh, next we can hear about an update about special education. This may take give me a, a minute or two. I don't know if it's appropriate to take a break for a couple of minutes because um, I'm managing technology as well as the presentation. So I'm going to have to try to get this set up on the other computer but I'll leave that up to the board's discretion.
Let's get started. So, we talked an awful lot over probably the course of uh, a couple of years now about the academic side of things, about the math ELA, and then science came on a little bit later. Um, the other piece that uh, has been a bit of a concern um, probably from the time that I walked in the door um, was special education. Um, and I didn't have a way of putting a real good handle on what was causing the concerns I was seeing. I knew that our population was much higher than it should be. Um, I talked with the administrative team when I came in and you know, asked them basic questions. You know, what's, what's the service delivery like? How do you deliver services to kids? You know, what outcomes are you expecting? And the answers weren't always that clear. And so what I did was I spent about two years going in doing direct observations and seeing what it looked like at each of the levels. And then pulling pieces together um, last year and saying, you know, we've got really good people that are capable of doing a really good job, but the structures and the models that we're using to try to deliver these services to kids just aren't working. Um, and one of the biggest concerns that I had was just that, you know, when I started, we were at 19% of every student in the district was on an IEP, and every year that goes by, that goes up by 1%. And it's like, okay, so what, what's causing this? I mean, is it, is it just that we're getting that many new kids each year when a new class comes in? Um, and, um, you know, not many kids that move out when, uh, you know, the senior, seniors move off? Um, or is there something else that's going on here? And that's a lot about what this examination is. And to talk a little bit about kind of what the strategic plan is moving forward with special education, because um, it is one of those, those end pieces that are on there. So I want to take a look at um, the raw data. Um, the raw data is actually really good because it was the first thing that I had that I was able to take a peek at when I came in the door. And it started to indicate that there were probably some problems there, but I couldn't quite put my finger on why. Um, we have the state findings that just came out. And what's interesting about the state findings is in terms of special education, the state was three to four years behind on collecting the data on special education programs in districts and handing it over to the federal government like they're supposed to. And so towards the end of the summer, all of a sudden, I start getting this report from 2016 from you know, the AOE that has the special education data from that year, and then you know, two or three days later, it's 2017. So they've actually started to pull this data and start to distribute it, which they should have been doing all along. Um, and there were some pretty good confirmations in the state data that, yeah, we do have some problems that we, that we got to deal with. I'll talk a little bit about what my concerns are, you know, as a superintendent, as a district leader here. And then some of the things that we've already started and some of the other things that we're going to add to that kind of moving forward to try to get a handle on this and, and, and get things better for kids in the district. Um, first thing to take a look at this first graph is this uh, IEP enrollment. It's the total number of students on IEPs in the district, and I apologize that it's a little hard to see. We run around 850 students total, not including preschool. Um, so you'll see back in 2017, um, we had you know, 160 um, special education kids. We're now in 2021, so this is data for this year. Uh, we're up to about 193. So we've been adding about nine IEP students per year. So yeah, our population is going up, but it's not going up astronomically. Um, and what you can also see if you take a look at that graph is you see you got a steep little curve, and then all of a sudden it's kind of petering out, you know, a nice little straight line. We're currently going up around five or six kids per year um, in terms of IEP students. Now, what's interesting is that we had a lot of costs um, and we'll talk about the special education budget in a little while, um, but there were a lot of huge surge in costs in special education. And one of the reasons early on when I started here was because we had a lot of trauma students. And trauma students are very expensive um, to try to remediate. And sometimes if their challenges um, that they have are beyond our ability um, to work with or to remediate, we end up having to send them out to an outplacement. And those outplacements are anywhere from, you know, if they're in our Raven program, you know, they're probably about 30000 a year. Um, they can be upwards of two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year um, to send one of those students out. Um, 
So I, at the very beginning of this, there were a lot of trauma students. What has changed in the last couple of years is, yeah, we're getting a couple of more students with each incoming class, um, but the disability that they're showing is primarily speech. So in other words, it's um, articulation problems, um, it's reading, it's writing. You know, they, they need extra help getting those skills. And so that has been growing. Um, a couple other things. Um, IEP students as a percentage of the overall population in the district um, is this next graph. So you'll see if you go to 2017, around 19.5% of the students in the district at that point in time um, were on IEPs. Um, where we're sitting right now is 22.3% of all the students in the district. Um, if you take a look at every student in the district, you take 22.3% of them, they're on IEPs. So that's a huge number. Um, in terms of state and national averages, Vermont is pretty much at the national average. Um, typically, you expect that number to be 12 to 14%. So we're, you know, not quite to twice the national average, but we're pushing that number. And so we've got to start asking this question, why? Um, and really, there's, there's two possibilities. Um, one is that we're getting more kids every year with incoming classes. I think that's about a third of the problem. We are getting more kids each year with incoming classes. I think two-thirds of the problem is the fact that the students, once we get them on an IEP, they're always on an IEP. For whatever reason, the method of delivery um, for services, and I apologize my back's a lot of problems, but I can't. Um, <laughs> is, uh, it's, it's not giving students the skills they need to, like we talk about, to get to a less restrictive IEP and to hopefully at some point in time come off. And so um, in looking at the data and some of the nuances that I've seen of, uh, as I'm walking around, I'm pretty convinced that this is the case. Um, just to take a look at the budget, in terms of the special education budget alone, during the same time period, if you go from 2018 to 2021, on average, every year that has gone by, that special education budget goes up by almost $400,000 a year. Okay? So if you look at the past four years, the special education portion of the budget is up 68%. 17% okay? per year. So again, the data, it's great stuff. I saw it coming in and I'm going, hey, you know, there's something that I don't think is right here, but it took those direct observations to allow me to be able to kind of drill down to what the, the reasons were. You know, if you average that out too, um, every new student that we have come in right now that um, is on an IEP who's new, you know, the average cost of one of those students is $44,000 per student. Um, so astronomical costs here. And more interesting here is um, the SPED percentage uh, how much um, of the SPED budget is of the overall budget. So if you go back to 2017, of the overall district budget, SPED took up 14%. Now, coming into this next year, SPED is taking up 20% of the overall district budget. All right. That's a little more complicated by the fact that that 20% means more now. 20% right? of the 2017 budget was much smaller than 20% of the budget that we're, we've got that's running this district right now. So we've got these huge increase in costs that are going on, yet no real impact it seems, and this goes back to some of Ann's, Ann's points, no real impact it seems in terms of improving outcomes for kids. So questions at all as we're looking at the data. So uh, can I ask a really quick question? Sure. You mentioned earlier that part of this increase was around the students in their language. Um, would you expect that that would actually improve with the preschool programs? One of the reasons to put in the preschool programs at the time um, was because it allows for early identification. They do get special education services um, yeah. in, in preschool. And again, what they're finding is that the students that are coming into the preschool, you know, um, it is primarily speech and language issues. So it, you should, in theory, be seeing these numbers going down with those established preschool programs. If we're doing everything else right. And so when we talked about there is longitudinal data, and I, we've, we've seen in the past with, we've looked at the SPED data in the past as part of that big, big program. Um, 
for whatever reason, our student sped population goes up year after year. That's not how it's supposed to work. Usually what happens is you have a huge increase in your sped population in your early grades because you're identifying things. And as kids progress through the years, um, the strategies, compensatory strategies that they may have had that would have helped them manage their disability in the educational environment, um, as the education gets harder, because you're advancing through the years, sometimes those strategies don't work anymore, and all of a sudden we reveal that you have a learning disability. Mm -hmm. But usually, you know, you get to third and fourth grade, everybody should be identified by that point in time. And then, at worst, it should be steady state. Appropriately, you should be seeing some students coming off IEPs or going to less restrictive IEPs. And the only place where we actually see that decline is after they get to ninth grade. From ninth to twelfth grade, there is a small decline in terms of SPED students, so there are some coming off. But for some reason, it doesn't happen until then. And so that's why there's been a big focus at the, the elementary levels to try to figure out what's happening with these kiddos and give them the services that we need. Are, are students actually coming off in ninth to twelfth grade, or are they dropping out of the system? A combination of both, and we're going to talk about that in, in the state findings here. Um, so these are the state findings, and I color-coded them. There's red, there's yellow, and there's green. Green means we're doing something better than we were. Yellow means we're in a cautionary area, and red means that the state has said, you've got problems here, um, you know, when this data came out. And when that data came out, right, it was like three, four years of data at the same time. The ones that I tagged were the consistent problems, so they've been unaddressed um, for, for three or four years now. Um, we didn't have the data to, to, to be able to take a look at them. But let's take a look at, look at these, and they're kind of important. So the first one there, post-secondary goals in an education plan that will reasonably enable students to meet those goals. So if you're a student on an IEP, one of the requirements in that plan is that you have a transition plan. You have an idea of what it is that you want to do when you get out of high school, and you have goals that are set up in this plan either th and that are accommodated through your programming or through the services that you're receiving that are going to help you get there. For some reason, 40% of the students in this district do not have that. I have a problem with that because this is simply people sitting down and writing it into the IEP and talking about it as a team. So this is what I, I would call, there's, there's management, there's leadership, there's different pieces. This is a simple management issue. This isn't something that should be happening. Those goals should be here. The next piece um, that I'm also going to call a management issue um, is that you know, IEPs are supposed to be reviewed annually at the end of each year. And then every three years, there's a bigger review that goes on with some more testing that, that comes into play. Um, we're not doing horribly, but we've got to think about what this means is that at the end of each year, 6% of our students aren't getting that IEP review. 100% of them should be getting that IEP review. That's when you sit down and talk about, this is how the student responded to the accommodations that we built for them. Yes, they're working, or no, they're not. And if they're not, this is where we change those accommodations to try something different to help the kid out. And so... 100% of these should be happening every year. Matter of fact, it's a violation of federal law that they're not. So that's a concern to me when I see this. And again, it's a management issue. It's, it's why isn't this getting done? Are the staff overworked? Are they not reminded? Is, is the adherence piece, is that adherence pressure not being applied to them to make sure that this is happening? Um, IEP students, we go to, to, to Elijah's comment on his graduation, is 89%, used to be 94%. Well, I have a feeling I know why his graduation rates have gone down a little bit. They're still very high. I mean, graduation rates in the nation as a whole are probably close to around 60%. You know, in the state, he's probably at the state average of 89%. Um, so it is, is a high average, but one of the reasons that that has probably declined over recent years is because we've got a growing number of IEP students every year, and a large number of them aren't making it through to graduation and getting a diploma. And so the impact he's seeing isn't the general population, it's the special education students. And so we were flagged on this, is we've got to get more of those students. It's an equity issue. 
more of those students need to be getting their way to a diploma. It doesn't matter to me if it takes them four years, sometimes five years, you know, if you spread their programming out so that as an accommodation, but we've got to be getting them to the diplomas. This next one is highlighted um, and italicized. And I got to talk about this a little bit. Um, under No Child Left Behind, when it first came out, they had all these benchmarks that people were supposed to meet. And if you didn't meet the benchmarks for two years, you know, you were found in a state of noncompliance. If you hit three years, your state could literally come in and intervene. In Massachusetts, they actually took over two or three school districts um, that, you know, couldn't get their scores up. Of course, when the state stepped in, things actually got worse than they were when they were being run on their own. Significant disproportionality, and I'll talk about what this means in the, we have a finding right now where the state is stepping in to intervene in terms of special education. And what this, and this just came out about a week ago, what this means is that um, disproportionality means that you got one of your groups of students that something dramatically different is happening from comparable groups. In our case, we are identifying white students as needing speech and language services at 3.32 times the normal rate. And so they're saying, we don't know why this is happening, but it's a problem here because it's three times what's happening everywhere else. Um, and so there is a plan in place. Um, there are part, members of the special education department are already meeting with the AOE to try to dig down on why this is going on um, and to get some training to hopefully improve it. But again... So that sounds like the case that we're over-identifying kids as being, you know, as needing IEPs. So, so that's contributing, obviously, to our high rate of special education students. So, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to go into some of the things I've seen when I dug, but I'm going to say that, yes, that's uh, there's an over-identification, but there is also a huge issue of students in speech and language from what I saw in the data last year that have actually gone through significant remediation and now need to exit the IEPs and haven't been exited. Now there were a number of students that were getting 15 minutes of service, you know, once, once a week or once every other week and it's like, okay, if you're getting 15 minutes of service, that's not going to do you any good. So either you're so good you don't need the services now or you need more to get you to the point where we can remediate you and, and, and fix the problem. Um, My quick question, can we guess why, what would be the reason to not get, follow through and get someone off an IEP that qualifies to or should be gotten off? Is it, is it that the, you know, the caseload is too high, they're not getting to it? Well, you're, at, you're, at, you're asking tough questions that I have the answers to, but you might not like them. Um, so. Removing students from IEP is, is conflict-ridden, right? Lots of times the parents have, have grown up with the kids. Um, they know that the services help, and they are extremely fearful and anxious and reluctant to see the student come off of an IEP. In those cases, uh, you need a person who is trained and talented in resolving that sort of conflict, being firm that no, you know, legitimately, this student no longer needs these services. Um, and having the conversation with the parent and other ways, um, things that might be done to help kind of ease their anxiety a little bit during the transition. But we're not going to take them off the services, you know, cold turkey. What we'll do is we'll transition them over into, into our MTSS programming, our, our structured tiered supports, for a week or two to help with the transition and then after that week or two is up, then they're on their own and we'll check in in six weeks and see how they're doing. But you got to have, have people in place that are able to have those sorts of conversations. And they're not easy to have. Um, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, you got the management side, you know, are you getting everything to work the way that it's supposed to? But there's also the, the, the leadership side and part of that is the managerial courage to say no when you need to say no. And that is not easy for anybody. So, again, knowing what I know, which isn't everything, um, it's a smattering of kind of what I've seen over time, I think that's a part of the problem um, in some of these cases. Um, but I also think a part
part of the problem is the fact that the services we're providing, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this, the services we par we're providing are getting the kids where we need them to be. And that was one of the reasons we talked about the restructuring, especially at the elementary level um, last year, you know, bringing in the cohort model um, and trying to deliver those services in a little bit different format. Um, again, we talked about this, 22.3% of students are on IEPs. Um, state and national average is actually 12 to 14%. Percentage of IEP students in outplacements. So those are students that, for whatever reason, we deem that we cannot accommodate their, their needs here, and we have sent them to an outplacement. We're at 5%, which is right on the borderline of, of turning into red from yellow. Uh, the state average is about 3.75%. Is that the same 5% that's not getting their IEP reviewed? Or so they're out they're out of our Yeah, and there's a uh, you know I can go into a little detail on this. One of the things that that was changed last year as part of this restructuring there were two pieces to it. Um, the first piece a little ahead of ourselves but that's okay we're having a good conversation. The first piece was the turning to a cohort model. Um, at the elementary level, where you've got one special education teacher for three classrooms with two paras, and they will all work together as a team so that they're constantly evaluating the kids on a daily or a weekly basis and adjusting as they need to um, with some real stringent goals of where they want the kid to be and, and striving to get them there. Um, that's something that didn't really exist. They were in kind of this management style where, yeah, the kid's on an IP, he needs his services, so we're just going to provide him the services, and there was no real goal to ever really get the kid off. You know, um, the other piece of this has to do with the outplacements. If I'm sending a student to an outplacement, it means I'm paying big bucks to help this student. You know, 170,000 is probably average. If I'm paying 170,000 a year, then damn it, I want to see some results. And one of the things that I noticed um, as part of how this was provided is our students would go to outplacement and never come back. And so part of what we tried to change last year is, okay, if you have a student that reaches this level that they have a behavior or they have a need um, for outplacement, when they go to outplacement, you sit down and you develop a very specific plan with that provider. You identify the one or two behaviors or learning disabilities that need to be remediated, and they focus solely on that. The one or two behaviors that have to be fixed for the student to be able to come back. And damn it, every 45 days, you go back in, you have another meeting, you see what the progress has been, and you change those uh, accommodations to get to the point where you've reached those, goal, those goals so that the student can come back to school and participate. Um, it is an exclusionary practice to send a kid, I mean, kid out, of, out, of, out of district. Um, I mean, it's the most restrictive you can be. Um, and it's, it's not healthy. Um, you know, there's times you've got to do it, you know, but um, the goal should always be to get them independent enough to be able to come back and, and, and work within the school environment here. Um, so are we, having, are we having a hard time as a, as a district communicating expectations to, to the consumers of the IEPs, to the, to the student and the families? Or, I think in the terms of the outplacements... Um, and not just outpla outplacements, but... But if, if an IEP is structured so that a student can eventually can graduate from their IEP, mm -hmm. are we not communicating that with the family that the goal of the IEP, IEP is to get them to the point where they don't need the IEP? I don't... And is that not set out in the beginning? I don't think... While it is an unspoken intent, my impression... And I want to be because I'm not trying to bash people here. That's that, that is. Mm -hmm. We've got good people. My impression is that they have never been said that that is the goal. The goal of an IEP, if it's done properly, is so that someday you don't need one. Right. Instead, and, and this happens in a lot of districts. It's not. This isn't unique to here. Um, the the student will go they'll work with the teacher you know there's a structure in place for how the <coughs> services the teacher provides to the kid in terms of supporting them with their homework or whatnot but the goal isn't what it should be which is okay it's not my job to provide this skill for you it's my job to teach you this skill so that you can do it for yourself i'm going to show it to you 
And then over the course of time, I'm going to slowly expect you to do more and more and more of it so that whether it's a week down the road, whether it's a month or a year or two years down the road, at some point in time, you have that entire skill in your repertoire and you can draw upon it as needed to, to, to meet your needs to access the, the educational environment. That's the piece that's missing, and that's the piece that's missing in a lot of schools around the, around the country, not just here. Um, and so that was one of the reasons to try to change that focus onto the gold piece. Um, but the, for me, you know, kind of looking at this, um, I always talk about programs in, in kind of when you're trying to build a successful program, whatever it is, whether it's special education, whether it's teaching science, um, you've got structure, you've got adherence, and you've got delivery. In the case of a class, you know, the structure is basically, you know, do you have a curriculum? That's a structure, right? That supports, supports the learning. Um, you know, do you have enough time in the day um, to be able to interact with a kid to, to get the kid to move in the, the curriculum? That's the structure. Adherence means is somebody actually following up with that teacher now that they have the curriculum to make sure that they're using it on a daily basis as they plan their lessons and interact with kids. And then once you got that under your belt and people are following along doing, doing exactly what they should, then you start to work on the really high order thing, which is the delivery. Yeah, you know, we're, we've got the curriculum, we're using it every day, but some of the lessons go well and some of them don't. So as part of our professional learning group, we're going to get together and we're going to talk about what's not going well so that we can come up with better learning activities and better lessons for kids. Um, so that our delivery of that instruction improves. So we're having a more positive impact on kids. And so with us right now, you know, I see some basic management issues in terms of, in terms of the special education department, and that's really down kind of at the structure level. But we've got some, some pretty big changes that we've got to make um, in terms of adherence and in terms of delivery um, that you really need some changes in our leadership structure um, so that we've got some leaders that are change agents. Now, some people are really good at managing. If things are up and running well, they can keep it running. If you need things changed, that's a different sort of personality, um, especially if it's a big change. And my biggest concern right now is I don't have those change agents um, to be able to make the changes I need. We've got the structure that needs to go into place and people are, are trying to follow it, but I need somebody, not me, because this special education is not my role, um, who can actually be that change agent and follow through on the adherence and the delivery and make sure that this happens. It seems um, to me if we're, in violation of, if we're in violation of laws and we've got all those red dots that... Well, the state of Vermont uh, on a whole is doing worse than we are. I don't care. <laughs> I know. And I, I don't either. That's why I'm focused on this yeah. right now. But, those are big problems. Yeah. But a lot of it... It, right, it's redesigning the leadership team. Um, it's making sure that, that that new service delivery model is implemented. And the reason to redesign that leadership team is I, I need people with the capacity, that, that change leadership piece. Um, some cases you can build it within the staff that you have. I have some staff I can do that with. In some cases I need to swap out staff. Um, right. It sounds like your staff is not meeting targets or goals. Yeah. And so if you weren't meeting targets or goals, we would replace you. But it also sounds like some of those targets and goals have not been made clear. And that's the leadership yeah. piece. You gotta, that's the change piece. You've got to have somebody who's making it clear. That's where the adherence comes from. Yeah, and then, you know, after everybody's doing what they're supposed to, and that's not a fun, fun job, especially if it's not something people have been expected to do before. Um, and then um, it's the fun job. The real fun job is the delivery piece. Okay, things are up and running. Things are starting to move in the right direction. Now we get to do the real cool stuff, which is the refinement. We get to make sure that not only are we doing it, but we're doing it well. Um, and so, you know, the strategic goals, um, you know, are up there for, for the special education department. You know, the biggest goal here in the yellow, IEPs that become less restrictive over time and which culminate in IEP removal. That's what we're shooting for. That's what all these changes are. So that's the measurable outcome. And it is measurable because as part of that restructuring last year, um, I did pull the team together. They were very good. They actually developed a rubric to be able to measure how restrictive students' IEPs are. So we can put them all together and say, on average, you know, we're a, on a scale of one to, one to five, you know, we're a, we're a 3.4 right now. 
and hopefully a year down the road or two years down the road, instead of being a 3.4, we're, we're more towards the, the least restrictive. We're now, you know, a 1.8 or a 1.2. And we can also track, yep, you know, this year we had this many students on IEPs, taking into account what came in and what left, right, the new class that came in, the class that ex exited, um, you know, we're, we're now down to this many IEPs, and that's, that's the goal. We've got to get down to that 12 to 14 percent, and I, I need some folks that can do that. So you're going to see, um, as we get into the budget season, you know, me talking about some staffing pieces. Not going to cost any more money, but doing some things with the staff that we have um, to try to get that, that uh, change capacity in there. So. Could I ask a quick question about Raven? You said some of our kids are, are yep. outplaced in Raven. How's Raven doing? Raven is actually, um, especially for the cost, is a very successful program. Um, if you define it in terms of getting kids through to a post-secondary something. I mean, they're, they're, they're very much like, uh, like the tech center. Um, they come in, they spend um, a couple hours each day doing the academic component, but then it's, it's really looking at, you know, small engine repair, machine repair, that sort of thing. It's more of a hands-on on education, so they do fairly well. It's a, and you, you're seeing better outcomes for those kids as yeah. they progress through. Yeah, but they're, um, the students in the Raven program, they're in a very narrow band of disability. Um, you know, you know, we're talking about some of the students that are going off for the, you know, the big, big bucks. Um, you know, that's a different category of students that go there. Right. Ra Raven, you know, if this is, if this is, you know, mild and this is severe, they're not quite in the middle. Okay. okay. So, some good questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. The goal was just you're going to see a lot of discussion and probably a lot of changes this year. I'm just trying to give you some background as to why um, was the goal of the, this presentation. Great. Good. Okay, next we move on to EL monitoring. This is our second read of two reports, um, 2.0 and 2.8. I hope you guys took some time to read them over. We have in the past had um, a lot of questions and issues around 2.8, which is the interactions between the board and the superintendent. Um, are there any questions for Lane around these two? I know we did first read them and had him speak a little bit about them last Hearing none, um, I would like to entertain a motion to approve uh, EL 2.0 and 2.8. I move that we uh, approve the 2.0 uh, and 2.8. I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? You say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Okay, next we have this scholarship investment report. Do you want to elaborate any further beyond what is uh, <laughs> in our packet? Yeah, more some kind of humorous anecdotes, I think. Um, financially, both of those scholarships are in good shape. So for those of you that are new, um, there were two kind of semi-endowment scholarships that we were given. Um, probably, I think it was around 2015. Um, one of them sits around $100,000 right now. We give out 5,000 of it every year, $2,500 scholarship to two students each year. Um, the other one, um, so that one's the Azel Hall um, Family Scholarship. The other one is the, the Community Scholarship, and that one um, is significant. That one's in the $2 million range. And um, so we give out a significant amount of money out of that. Probably, you know, I think this last year was in the two hundred and forty thousand dollar range. It's a four year scholarship, and um, it's changed a little bit in terms of uh, what the the donors who want to remain anonymous anonymous expect. Um, they used to have a provision in there that they'd like you know students to try to pay back ten percent if they can just to keep things uh, moving forward. They've removed that provision. Used to be they just wanted to see, you know, Vermont colleges if possible, um, and they've relaxed that. They've also opened it up to students because we have so many students that are coming in under school choice now um, to school choice students. Um, one of the things is that they do want to see that scholarship spent. They've been very clear that it was not meant to be a, um, you know, a perpetual, you know, um, you know, 
everything. So we've been increasing the spending each year. We just don't have enough students. It earns too much interest for us to be able to, to, to you know, you know, liquidate that that anytime soon. Um, my guess is is at the rate we're going, you know, we're probably 10, 15 years away from from being able to do that. Um, I don't know the exact reason um, why in my conversations, um, and they're wonderful people. I'm very thankful for the scholarship. I have a feeling that they're getting a little older and they'd like to see the scholarship done um, you know, before things end. And uh, I think that's a, a part of the reason, but I'm not sure. Like I said, we've been upping and upping and upping how much we're giving out each year. and We're still not even making a dent in the thing. So, but they're, they're both in really good shape. Yeah, it could be. Um, and then there was another outside of those two. I think it says in there there's about 140,000 in scholarships total that was given out last year. Um, so, That's great. Yeah, for the class of 2020, that community scholarship that usually you give out, I think it was about 240 that we gave out, but again, we're giving out the students across four years because right. Right, it's a four year scholarship. Okay, we have the consent agenda. We've got um, to approve the minutes from our last meeting, um, August 10th, which were enclosed. Um, we have to approve professional contracts, um, which are which is enclosed in our um, packet. And then we have to review and approve the facilities reserve funds. So I guess we ought to do them separately. So let's first do the minutes from the August meeting. I have a motion to approve that. Move to approve the August minutes and second term. Any amendments or substitutions, corrections? All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, uh, we need to approve the professional contracts. Is there a motion to do uh, that? I move we approve professional contracts. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so next is this uh, facilities reserves funds. Um, you want to speak to that a little later? Yeah, so this is uh, kind of what we're talking about. Um, we have a couple of reserve funds out there that there is money in um, that we can draw from um, at need with board approval. Um, the facilities reserve fund, I believe, because this was built when Brent was here before before I came along, I think he was actually the mastermind across the state of being able to do this, which was kind of cool. Um, but he put it into place so that every time there was a surplus, you could put money in it so that when big things came up, like replacing the roofs, we didn't have to go out to, to bond. Um, you know, we didn't have to ask the, the, the town to go into debt for it. And so it's worked out really well. So that's what the reserve fund is. There's there's about three million in there, I believe, at this point in time, um, give or give or take a little bit after this summer. Um, the money that we're looking for is for two custodial positions for this year alone, and it's to help out with the COVID disinfectant, disinfecting and cleaning of the buildings um, every day. Um, you know, they've they've got what they need to do the basics and get their disinfecting done, but some of the normal, more normal cleaning routines is a little bit more difficult. You know, cleaning's not, clean, cleaning's separate from disinfecting. Disinfecting's what we gotta have. Um, if we gotta slack on something, we'll, we'll slack a little bit on maybe sweeping the floors or um, you know, emptying the trash cans every day, but the disinfecting's gotta happen. If we can get these two, um, we'll be able to cover all the other parts and pieces we should be doing as well in terms of the cleaning side of things. So you're requesting 132,000, which will be? It won't be that much. That's taking into account if they're um, in the middle of the support staff pay scale and they take the family medical, that'll be available in January. So it shouldn't be that much. But. And this is, this is gonna be two one-year contracts? Two one-year contracts, yeah. Any questions for Lane about this? Do I have a motion to approve $132,000 from the uh, Facilities Reserve Fund to go towards uh, these two COVID employees? I move to approve the Facility Reserve Fund's request for the custodial workers, whatever so important right now. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
right. And we don't actually pull the money from the reserve funds unless we have to. So if we have surplus towards the end of the year that we can use towards it, we do that first, and then if we still need to, you know, you, you're allowing us to draw up to the 132 if we need to. All right, so for reports, we have your report. Is there anything to add or elaborate on? God, I hope not. <laughs> I, think we, I think we talked all. But like I said, a lot of it right now, um, looks like the network's going down. A lot of it right now is uh, just the unknowns. You know, it's, it's very hard to plan a budget. Um, we can't even get advice uh, from the state on whether are we planning for another COVID year next year or a more normal year? And that's not something, you know, reasonably that they can probably even answer, but, you know, it would help. Um, we can't get information from them on, you know, you had these grants that we're supposed to be getting some reimbursement from, but they can't give us a timeline on when that may happen. Um, and so it's just, everything is just unknown. Our financials, um, in terms of what they are for this month, however, are, are actually good. Now we were overspending a little bit, obviously, on the maintenance side of things for um, you know the cleaning, cleaning and the disinfecting. But other than that, we're in pretty good shape. And how has the first week of school gone? Too quiet. <laughs> I got one parent email. It's like you've logged off, Lane. Yeah. 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 It says it's the network's down. Saying it's trying to reconnect. Let me see if I can go back on. Can't be reached. I'll see if I can stir up some parent emails for you. <laughs> yeah. Not that it hasn't, you know. You know what? I walked around the first two days. Um, I got into all the schools that, once, if not twice, last week. It was quiet. The kids were happy. You know what the coolest thing was? Especially the little kids, they were so excited to be back. I mean, it was like, it, it, was, it was just special to see. Um, the high school, um, high school was very quiet coming through the halls. I think it's the masks. Um, it's, in an odd way, it's kind of soothing to the kids. They're not as boisterous. They're not as loud. You know, they're still, you know, they're being kids and whatnot. But it's, uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting. Well, there's only half of them there too, so yeah. that could be it. Yeah, mine has four. Oh my goodness! <laughs> well then. Yeah, I can't get back on. Wow. I, I turned on my volume. Okay. So I'll share that my son started RTCC and he can't say enough positive about um, the leadership, the, the um, structure of the day, and I will say that the um, very direct communication coming from Felicia has been really very nice. Um, it's been a very, very positive two days in session. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's, uh, I think one of the things keep in the back of your mind that uh, it can all change on a dime. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. You know, there's there two two districts right now are going through it in state. So, I'm not going to say because I don't want, I don't know which one you know about, which one you don't. Because that will probably be in the news in a day or so. Yeah, the Crosser Brook was in the news already. Yeah. Okay. Where's that? In Duxbury. Yeah. That's a. I think that may be a different one. That was in the news. I saw the article today. I think that's different than the two I know. Yeah, that came out yesterday. But just yeah, so just 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 keep that in the back of back of folks' mind is that you know at any point in time the call could be going out that we have to shut down a school. Mm. It won't be the entire district. And when I say shut down, it means we go to remote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think we're I think we're ready. <laughs> But I think we're all mentally prepared. <laughs> well, people are, the other other thing just to keep in, in back of mind is that, um, it's been a long summer without a break. And people are tired and they're a little more on edge than, than normal. And it's, it's, it's just because people are tired. You know, par parents, kids, well, not the kids. The kids are actually kind of cool. Um, the, but the, the parents and the teachers and whatnot, just a little edgier than normal. But I think it's just the stress and uh, the anxiety. How will that work when, you know, for the, you know, we're in this hybrid model now, if you go, have to go all remote all of a sudden, how does that work for those hybrid kids? So they end up, the, all the hybrid kids will be home learning at home. Um, the way the MOU worked with the union was that if you get a hit in one of the schools, um, we 
go to remote learning for at least 14 days and you stay that way until 14 days after the last case has been identified. And um, the whole group would be combined into four days of remote learning all together with the teacher. Yeah, so that's what I was kind of wondering. We're, we're split up. Yeah, and there's a, there's a separate plan I sent out, but it probably didn't make much sense when I did it. That's a couple of pages long. There's the remote learning plan. Mm -hmm. And so that one kind of outlines, you know, what a school day looks like, you know, how many hours a teacher's supposed to spend doing this versus this versus that. Um, that goes into effect if uh, school goes into remote learning or if the whole district does. So that's, that's all spelled out. So yeah, let's keep our fingers crossed. Sports have been going. It's been actually kind of neat seeing the kids. There's uh, three different practices every day out on the fields, um, and that's before the town leagues get started. They're in soccer. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> they don't like the mass. Well, they don't they, one day the coach had let them out early that 80 degree day. They were uh, they were sucking wind out there, wearing masks, trying to run around that heat. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's a yeah. uh, frost advisory tonight, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it sure is. So, okay. I got a soft topic again. I apologize. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so next we have some board development work. This is our, our strategic planning goals work. Um, Rachel's going to sort of start us off yeah. facilitating this discussion. So this kind of comes out of our... So Rachel, do you want to turn on your volume? I'll turn off mine. Oh. I'm going to restart my computer to see if that does it. Yes. But you're still getting a signal? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Okay. At the bottom. We good? Mm -hmm. okay. This kind of comes out of our, our board retreat in July. And we have the we had the four areas that we identified that we wanted to work on or wanted to make kind of our strict our strategic goals. Um, what the first one was community engagement. And I think I think that's going to be just kind of wrapped up in in working on the other three. So the other three were working on high school academics high school climate and middle and the middle school transition, if you all remember. And you all probably have the emails. Laura resent the email last, um, last board meeting. So we need to determine as a board what our next steps are in working on these. And now's the time to do that. How do we want to start addressing, addressing these, these issues? Addressing these issues. Ooh. Got yeah, that's why I'm echoing. All right. So, ideas. How do we want to do this? We are seeking input from community. Is that one of our goals, or is that one of? Yes. So we are. So I think as we address the three, the other three, it will be. I, I think. It will be in a way that we are pulling in the community to per participate in those those processes. Making sure that our kind of strategic goal is in line with what the community yeah. feels also. Or how the community, if the community feels invested in these goals. Yes. I think with the information that we glean being at board at board meetings and talking and reviewing what, what the, going through all the budget planning with Lane and reviewing what, reviewing the data that's given to us in our ends monitoring, we're kind of in a unique position as board members to identify these. So we need to know if our community buys into them, and if so, how do they? Can they help us envision how we, how we guide our, mm -hmm. our district in developing them? And honestly. We want the whole community involved, but most of these are going to be people who have a vested interest in the high school climate or the high school academics. Most of the people who are going to participate are going to be people who who have a who have a specific interest in making that a good thing. I would think, but I think we should invite anyone to participate, any of our stakeholders, which means all of our community members. I think it's really important to include or somehow incorporate like if, if we're going to talk about high school academics to to incorporate the the building principles you know the two high school principals and any other interested teachers in from 
the get-go. Mm -hmm. So that their goals and our goals, you know, we're really relying on their goals. You know, we, we see this as a need, but we want to, in, you know, give them sort of the, the means to go forward with them, like, and develop the goals for themselves. Um, so whether we just invite them or, you know, how we orchestrate that investment on their, on their part and, you know, get certain teachers who are interested in working on this um, involved right off from the get-go, I think is really important. You've got some real powerful teachers that'll be very beneficial. And I think for the same thing for the high school climate issue, you know, because that's such a vague word, climate, it's very hard to pinpoint or define exactly what we're what we're targeting there. And but I think there's some so I people who really would know how what what that means and how to address it. And I pulled um, I was thinking about it before this meeting. I didn't admit so much it was already on the plate, but I went on to the CDC website. They have a school climate survey um, that is designed to be given, you know, it's broken up into different parts. It's designed for parents, for kids, for faculty, for support staff members. The um, only problem with it is that it's a bit long, but it would be a starting point to get some data about what it is specifically about the climate. Um, you might want to, if it's something that the group wants to use, I'm happy to hand it over. We can develop a survey monkey or, or whatnot to go out with it. But I would whittle it down to what you think are the most important questions. Out of, I think there's about 63 per that we're in it. Wow. Yeah. So we need to identify some next steps. I think, I think it's important that we don't just talk about this and we actually have actual right. items, right? right. So but it makes sense, and that then do to like even form subcommittees. Like, are there board members who are interested in one? Or are we going right, to together? Right, because you're already involved with a group that. Yeah, and that was my other question: is right. that there was a big move? Um, and I'm sorry that Lisa's gone to not ask for this. There was a big move as far as that middle school transition goes, and there was mm -hmm. already a group kind of going with that. So. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make sense for us to double the effort, right? You know, or and just kind of hopefully meld that in, right? Um, to to identify the board's role in that and that in that exactly. But I don't even do you know, Lane, if that's right. still uh, Lisa Floyd, who was here tonight. Yeah, I know, but do you know if if that committee is still happening? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of it, you know, they're looking at the, the two grades that are here. Um, that's the, they're calling it the lower house right now. And trying to put it onto a real middle school model and see what the impact is. And if it's significant enough, then we'll come back and revisit, you know, the potential of moving the sixth grade here. Um, it's hard to tell right now um, because of the preschool, um, because parents are anxious. There's a lot of kids that were pulled out of preschool and whatnot. Some are actually coming back now. The parents have had them home for a week and they're deciding that had a couple of homeschoolers that pulled them out to homeschool too that are now coming back. Um, they figured a week, week or two was enough. But um, yeah, so the hope is is that after COVID you know, declines or is over, whichever the case may be, is those preschool numbers go back up. And then we have the impetus, the, the need to actually move those sixth graders over. So, but yeah, they're still meeting. That's a part of the structure that um, Elijah was talking about that they were building this year. When you say a, a real middle school model, what, what do you mean by that uh, versus to what they have right now? They come over and they're kind of mini high school kids. Um, middle school is a time of transition in, in, in a lot of areas. You know, it's not just the social transition. You're transitioning to a more abstract sort of reasoning that goes along with the learning. Um, typically, the huge impact of that happens in seventh grade. Um, but it's, uh, it's about providing them the supports to help them through the social transitions, um, to spend a little bit more time on the study skills and the routines that are required to deal with the more kind of abstract thinking that you're going to need to do. Um, there's a whole lot of pieces um, that, that go into that, but there's about three or four major transitions that are going on. That so it's not necessarily a, a change, because I mean, when you said that, I was thinking like, 
Are they going to change how the if the day is set up for the kids, or is it just more could, of could, the could, delivery? Could could be all of it. Um, you know, you do try to get a, a core team for each grade so that they're interacting with the same teachers all year because that builds a little bit of trust when they have to talk more about the social side of things. Um, so there's lots of parts and pieces that can go into it. Um, so it can be a pretty powerful model. And, and one of the reasons that we were drawn to it is I, with the data with last year is, you know, I kind of showed you that it didn't matter whether it was ELA or math or which school the kids were coming from. You know, the scores would go up through the elementary level. They get the fifth grade. The scores would start to drop. Sixth grade, they'd take this tank. And then seventh grade, they were down here. And then they would start to climb again, you know, through the high school. And so when you see that across all kids from all schools in all disciplines, it usually indicates that there's some major structure that you need to be able to help these kids you know, make those transitions. And so that was one of the reasons we started looking at the middle school um, piece at the time. But yeah, you'll, you'll see that it's the boom, and then it comes back up. And it's like, whoa, that doesn't make sense. But I, I went back 10 years, and the data happened every year for 10 years. You know, as far as I can go back and look in the data, even when we were on the um, the test before SBAT, ECAP or whatever it was. Yeah. So I guess there's four areas that we're looking into, right, talking about. Are there, is it worth, you know, um, stating kind of our desire, which area we'd be interested in focusing on individually, or is it, uh, I guess that's my question. Like, are we looking as a board? At each of the four areas, or are we going to do kind of like a subcommittee work? Well, I think really there's three because community engagement is an overarching goal that I think we'll will address or maybe even achieve once we work on these, right? Through working on them, I mm -hmm. think. Don't you? Or do you think we need a specific community engagement team? Um, I don't know. That's a big question. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I do feel like community engagement is a huge piece of building community rapport and mm -hmm. um, trust and just support. So I don't know if that's achieved through fostering these different areas or if it's also achieved through a real dedicated look at how we can improve that community engagement. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a valuable pursuit for sure you know, above and beyond these, working through these. I do think that working on these different aspects will support community engagement, mm -hmm. but I do think there's an overarching. Yeah, we could potentially build a structure that, yeah. that allows kind of ongoing community engagement. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the processes that we talked about this, if it's of value, um, is when you've identified the problem, um, you know, you've got to define a little bit about what it looks like, but more importantly, you've got to define about what you want it to be, the, what the desired state is. And then the discussion after you've identified what the desired state is, where you want things to be, um, is you do the gap analysis. Is you sit down and you kind of talk about, okay, this is where we want to be, this is where we're at, what are the things that we've got to put in place to get there, and that's how you kind of do your goal, goal setting around. But, it's a pretty it's a pretty slick process. It can go pretty quick. So the next steps. I mean I think committee work is is a possibility. Um, I think I think the idea of of you know using this survey that Lynn suggested in you know just starting to invo involve the high school staff is a good idea. I mean, I think the middle school transition is, you know, we already have a working group and perhaps, you know, sitting in on that work would be useful for one or two board members. I would definitely be interested in continuing with that group as I started with them last year, so. So do we want to go ahead and form subcommittees now to work on each of these areas? And how many people should we have on each subcommittee? We have four areas. We have eight board members. Is two enough or no? I don't know. Thoughts? I don't know. Um, are we, are we going to actually do a committee for community engagement? Or are we going to wait until we've got some stuff together on these other I would think that community engagement can be kind of a 
um, more of an action plan that we we agree on as a group Together. here, and then How follow through with it. Through into all of the industry. right. So I mean, you know, like we had talked when Paul and I talked about the first time was, you know, when we do this, we need to actually kind of target the group that we're looking at that we want to, to contact, not just throw it out there for everybody to, to comment, but if we want to talk to the teachers, we, you know, physically, you know, get to talk with them and not just uh, throw it out there. So that's, I mean, maybe we decide kind of a, an action plan of, of how we want to pursue this, mm -hmm. and then we just follow through with it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if we're talking with the middle school, do we want to have a, a, a meeting with the middle school parents and, you know, send, you know, get the whole list and, and send them out this a survey or whatever we need to do, but target those parents. And then, or if we want to tar target, you know, the, the community members, we, maybe we do something like that. But I think if we have a kind of an action plan that will cover our community engagement, we can just use that and direct it to the other three. So how do we develop, so just starting with community engagement, how do we develop an action plan that we can all agree on and vote on? And do, do, we, do we have one person work on it and present it to the group? Do we, do we talk about it right now? What I worry about is that we, yeah. we talk a lot and then and not a lot gets done. Right. And so we can talk about talking about this, yep. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but well, but I, I think, think we I need mean, to put pen to paper at some point and say, this is our action plan. And how do we accomplish that? And if we, and one of the tr one of the restrictions on accomplishing some of this is that there are we have we have board policies that restrict our interactions. We have open open meeting laws that restrict our actions. As far as yeah. like just having open conversation or ongoing conversation, we have to do it in the confines of a public meeting. But you have so, the right to change those policies if they're getting in the way of what you're trying to accomplish. That's one of the nice things about the policy governance is you can slide them. Policies, yes, but we have the, the, the open meetings and that piece that we is, have yeah. that's dictated. So, so do we send somebody to work on an action plan that we present and then discuss at our next meeting? Do we decide on an action plan, talk about it and decide on it right now? I mean, it's, it's a lot to do when we've already been sitting here for two and a half hours, yeah. three hours. It's a lot to say, okay, now we're going to sit here and hash out a plan. I mean, really, we should do some committee work, I think. You know, I think two or three people, if, if we want to say, let's, so what's next? How do we move forward on this before assigning ourselves, you know, various aspects of the, of the goals, you know, is that we do an action plan for the entire thing. Yeah for our strategic plan. And so that's, it probably works best, two or three of us sitting down together and figuring out like, how, how do we grapple with this? And, you know, how do we, wh what are our next steps and what are we gonna do and who are we gonna assign and like all those sorts of specifics. Mm -hmm. So. So we need to form subcommittees. So it sounds good. One, well, we could start with one and make a next steps committee. I don't know. Or Let's do, do it. We need more that sounds one. good. Yeah. I'm Pro proposing to vote. So, so, what is, so we're going to make a committee that's going to figure out the next steps for these three strategic planning goals we have, as well as the community engagement one. But it, seems to me the community engagement one, we, oh, I guess maybe I don't understand the community engagement one. The community engagement one, won't the transition from elementary school to middle school, won't they be engaging the community? So, so and then more. wouldn't the high school climate be also engaging with the community? So that seems to be, like that will be part of the action steps for those particular goals. I think it's it's that, it's used as a tool in each of those, but I think that there has to be what is the tool? 
-hmm. you know, identifying the demographic you want to engage. How are you going to get in touch with that demographic? You know, um, who's going to come up with the questions? Who's going to put the survey together? It applies to each of the other mm -hmm. three, but there has to be a, a, a model. It would be helpful to have a model. It would be helpful. And, and that's yeah. why we've identified it as a, as a, mm -hmm. yeah. as a goal. So, so a model of how you would do the community engagement. So is there any support from the women that we met with, like on that strategic planning that's done amongst a school district? Do you think there's any benefit in us? Basically, because I think about how I do strategic planning at the hospital, and it feels very different than this. And I'm just wondering in the school if it's, is she going to be beneficial or is that organization going to be beneficial so we don't just grapple and talk and not move forward with. Well, as we just learned, we've got an extra 5,000 bucks for a board development. I mean, we could do an extra meeting. We could do a, you know, same thing we did for our retreat, you know, from six until nine, another evening and ha have her help us out, you know, to, to, to make those next steps, and maybe that's the most efficient use of our time. I think that would be beneficial because I'm not very well versed on strategic plans. So, um, I mean, I can reach out to Susan, the same woman, Susan. Olson. Yeah, I mean, pro probably do it sooner rather than later, so we can move ahead. I mean, how do, how do the rest of you feel about an extra meeting one night? I, I, that's fine, and I do agree. I feel like it would be nice to have. I feel like we were, we were given all this, and then it was like, here. Mm. But, but that kind of like next, like, okay, great, now we have this. Like, how do we get sort of end of it? And maybe what we could do is maybe give her where we're at right now, and then so she can kind of prepare her presentation to kind of what we're really looking Shoot for. Mm -hmm. yep. And then we can still keep moving ahead and not have another four-hour meeting and meeting about a meeting yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like when she certainly brought um, like structure to that meeting but it would be helpful if she could put some of those meat like that meat on the bones for mm -hmm. us to then enhance and not really walk in with a clean slate where we yeah start yeah that's um, what I was kind of mm -hmm. kind of thinking yeah. was is you know if we can get kind of a summary or, or an outline of where we're at right now with our discussions and give that to her before the meeting so she can have a, a, a presentation or, or to help us get to where we want to be. Well, if you, pick, if you pick one of those three or four, if you're considering the community engagement as well, and have her facilitate the process to go to completion for one of them, then you should be able to mimic that process for the other three. And that's usually what you use the facilitator for, is you get them to come in, they, they go through the process, so you learn how to kind of do it. Um, if that's a value, it's just a suggestion. I will reach out to her, I'll give her a call tomorrow. Um, if we're agreed mm -hmm. as to that's the way we want to proceed. Um, can we right now decide, like, so I have a, a few dates in mind, like, do Monday nights work? Mm -hmm. I mean, this Monday, the yes. second always does. So, like, should we do yes. a Monday evening? Are there any you I know, can't first do third, third Mondays? You can't month. do third. Okay, no. not third Mondays. Do the other Mondays work for everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. I will suggest a Monday evening from like six to nine, and hopefully we can do it in person, like this. All right. Now, do do we want to just like Lane said, decide on kind of our maybe our most important one? and have her be prepared to help us soup to nuts to get that one complete in that time? That's fine with me. I think we should be prepared to suggest that to her. If, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't just want to hand her back what she helped us come up with and say, okay. You know. Why not? Well, and she may have a... <laughs> what do we do now? Do the rest. She may have a... Having, she might have been through this before and said, okay, well, this is typically what I do with, right. you know, as the next steps, as the now what, you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember, and again, I'm a little bit of my hospital hat on here, is that um, we have a lot of opinions, but really, I think it does come down to the people who are the true experts on this. And while we think, you know, we hear what people perceive and how we perceive, I mean, it does... 
to me, our next best steps are to have some of that feedback from the people involved. And I think even going, bringing in this external support is a great idea, but I think to come in with what we have right now and nothing additional isn't going to be that helpful. Because she's already heard that. She heard our discussion. So somehow, and I don't know, Lane, even if, if you, like, it sounds like the middle school structure has a lot of um, material behind it. There's a lot of stuff, you know, that's been happening. So that to me sounds like almost like ready for prime time. But again, my opinion on academics and climate and the high school might be very different than Laura's opinion. Yeah. So how do we present that to an external facilitator? I did email the survey to all of you, hopefully. Just now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that might give you some data to work on to kind of pinpoint, or have just an open forum with um, some of the faculty here, because they'll tell you exactly, you know, what it is that they consider climate that, you know, they'd like to see changed. Um, a lot of it's comments in the halls, it's the language that they use, a lot of it's the racism piece. Um, you know, and what I've been finding more and more is that when they're talking climate, it's the, it's the racism. Really? Yeah. Well, and the teacher's perception of climate may be different than the students. Right. Thing. Do you have that with the student council? They, um, they did away with it for some reason, and then last year they had a leadership group that Elijah started up that I think is still in place, but it's not a council like a student council. Mm. Uh, but there are, there are student leaders here that could definitely be a part, uh, that, are, that are voted in, that are represented. Yeah, sometimes student leaders, though, are... Depends on who was elected. Yeah, yeah. are different from the kids. Elected. Sometimes the best way to go about that is... Um, connect with uh, guidance and just say, hey, we're looking for some balanced balanced um, students that are straight up and open and honest and good to talk to, and they'll, they'll, they'll be able to name off a list of them. I just feel like a little bit of that work has to happen to have a better mm -hmm. understanding of the, of the issues for us to be able to successfully move forward. And my follow-up mm -hmm. question to that is, the creation of this strategic plan, what's the timeline for, for it to be public and complete? Well, I mean, so it's supposed to be a three-year strategic plan. Yep. Um, the last one is 2017 to 2020. Okay. So, you know, the new one should be 2021. So I think yeah. we've got time. Um, I agree with you. We do need to flush these things out. But I think time is of the essence. Yep. I sort of feel like if we had a facilitator help us sort of think through, you know, sort of like where do we go, how, how do we best use our resources, whether they're our teachers, our students, our community, how do we best incorporate them into helping us design, you know, a strategic plan for the district. I feel like we could do more of that preparatory work before we involve, you know, surveys or, or students or, and all these other things. I, I think so it's kind of like a two-part meeting with Susan, maybe, like that, how to prepare and maybe to bring her back when we have the information. Maybe. Can, can I, do we have the 2017 to 2020 yes. strategic it's on, plan? It's, it's, Was that it's on the part? website. It's so. on the website. And okay. before we had Susan Holson, I gave you guys the link to it. It's okay. right there available on the website. And that was a massive strategic plan. There were lots of pieces to that. And the board didn't do it. Yeah, that was, that was Brent. Yeah. Oh. We weren't involved in that. We had board goals, but they were different from the, the district's strategic plan. Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of good things on there. There were, there were a lot of things that was interesting on that, that when I came in, still got completed because there were a lot of things on there that when I was walking through, it's like, oh, wow, yeah, this is, you know, it was, it was spot on. So it was, it was good work. He, he did it. It was just, it was a lot. A lot yeah. Of some pieces I mean, it's sort of a daunting yeah. <laughs> document to look through because mm -hmm. yeah, usually to, to it's, replicate that, it's hard, right? Usually it's like three or four columns and it's a couple mm -hmm. bullets each. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think it's a misnomer to say it's our strategic planning because it's really it's district-wide mm -hmm. strategic planning. And if you're worried on the timing pieces um, because it may have a budget impact, you know, usually you try to align it so that it's 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 in a fairly complete form in case there's a budget impact so that we can incorporate it into budget planning. So you know, if you're trying to get it done this year, you know, you'd be shooting for your January meeting, January, because mm -hmm. that's when you vote on the budget as a board. <laughs> If not, then you can you know work on it this year, and we get it you know ready to go for the when the budget picks up again next October, a year from year. Or well, we approve it and we wait for the budget piece after. Yep. Yeah, if there's a budget for right, there which there usually is. What do the rest of you think? Do we, do you know? Do we want to go ahead with a facilitated meeting, or do we want to tackle this some other way? I feel like the meeting would give us a little bit more direction rather than kind of the what do we want to do next um, and maybe just help us help steer us in some valuable give us some valuable insight into how to move forward. I agree. Yeah. So is everyone on board with that? Okay. I'll um I'll get back to you as soon as I chat with her. Anything further on this process? Rachel? This could be probably a standing agenda item. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's, let's make sure to include it. Um, until it's complete. Mm -hmm. January. I think that should be. I think, I, think I think we should be aiming for January. Um, board self-evaluation, Hannah. Yes, um, I, I know this happens almost every meeting we get fives, but I, I um, except for me being late, uh, we were all prepared. It was well attended. You know, I've been really pleased with um, how many members of the public have, have been um, calling in. We followed the agenda, we kept on topic. Um, we were respectful, courteous, listened to each other, avoided side conversations. I'm doing five all the way down. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, and uh, do we have an executive session? This well, not much you want one. I don't, um, I don't need to do one. I would like to have one. I've got a okay. personnel question or okay. comment. All right.